Please join me in a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening and welcome to the June 26, 2017 Board of Selectmen's meeting. Uh, we're going to start with a public hearing pursuant to RSA 41-14-A, Proceedings, Amend and Release of Town-Owned Deed Restriction on Formerly Leased Land, Second Hearing. Paul M. Adlin and Dana M. Morgo, 4A and 4B Atlantic Ave, request to amend deed restriction number three. No fences may be created upon said premises other than the ornamental ornamental fences of no more than three foot height to install a six foot fence. So do we have anybody from the public who wishes to speak to this uh, deed release? Seeing nobody, I'll come back to the board. Does anybody on the board have anything to say on this right now? I don't know. Is tonight the night we make the decision? or No, next, no, next no, time? next meeting. Okay. So there will be one more uh, public hearing on this, and then we'll make the uh, decision on the next one. The next one is Ms. Cara, Cara Edger, 911 Ocean Boulevard, request to amend deed restriction number four. The grantee will not erect any building upon the premises within seven feet of any boundary line. Anybody from the public wishing to be heard on this one? Seeing no one, come to the board. Second meeting? Is this the second, second meeting? Second, second meeting. Okay. Nothing? Okay. We'll close those public hearings at uh, 7.05. And then we have public hearing pursuant to RSA 41 14-A proceedings. Donation of land to the town. Second hearing. Chuck Realty Corporation, parcel A. Land to be deeded to the town of Hampton and combined with map 150, lot 52 containing 1.33 acres. Anybody from the public wishing to be heard on that one? And we can have uh, our town attorney speak to it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At the board's last meeting, when you did the first public hearing on this 4114A process, uh, the board asked me for input concerning the uh, statements by uh, one particular resident who is an abutter to this uh, the parcel that's proposed to be developed, which is giving the property free to the town, uh, in indicating that that would be, uh, in her view, uh, inconsistent with a claim that she says was backed up by a report that the town owns the entirety of the pond. Um, the situation came about when this was in front of the planning board earlier in the year. Uh, the applicant which was for a five-lot, uh, five-unit condominium uh, development, presented a surveyor-stamped plan which showed, according to them, that uh, they owned this uh, area of the pond adjacent to their development. Uh, through discussion with the town manager, they agreed that they would convey that portion plus two feet of the shoreline to the town. Uh, in a quit claim deed, which gives up whatever right they have. I believe that is uh, at no cost to the town and is not inconsistent with any claim that the town owns the pond. I don't think the town loses anything by accepting that uh, the proposed deed. Okay, thank you very much. The board? I have no further. Nothing further. Nothing. Mr. Bean? Negative, sir. Mr. Griffin? <coughs> so, it, Mark, are you saying the town does own the pond? I am not saying that. What I'm saying to you is that, uh, according to the resident who is here, there was a uh, one-page uh, narrative by another surveyor, not a stamped plan, which claimed that going back in time, back to the first divisions of the town, that based on her research, the town owns the owns the pond. I'm not sure that's true. The manager spoke with that other surveyor, asked for the information, the deeds that supposedly backed this up, and uh, was, was denied them. That's my understanding. Is that right, Fred? That's correct. So uh, without examining what this other person says, I can't say to you one way or the other whether or not, yes, we do own it. Uh, but what I'm saying to you is if we're given whatever title this 
uh, butter has to their what they said was their portion of the pond, uh, we eliminate at least their claim, which is not inconsistent with the other claim if it ever comes about. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, this was a second hearing also? Yes, sir. Okay, so we're going to close this hearing at uh, 7.08, and we will now go to public comment period. If there's anybody in the public who's wishing to speak on any matter, now's the time to do it. And if you'd come up to the podium, please, state your name and address, and go ahead. So in the back, you want to come up? And if you speak right into the microphone so that they'll hear you. Hello, my name is Charles Locke. I live at 550 Winnicott Road. I've lived here for 10 years. And during the time I've been here, I keep seeing the high street is flooded at a constant pace. And I see that you guys are really trying to get it done, or the state, not sure which. But there's about 600 feet that would be on the south side of the street. If they went behind the mailboxes and behind the utility poles and put a soil down for a stretch and planted the rose bushes in there, that would hold the water back. I don't know if you guys already been through that or not, but that's my viewpoint because there's two reasons. You got the mill trucks got to drive through it, you got the police cars got to drive through it, and I got to drive through it. And that's my piece. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else in the public wishing to be heard? Jay? Good evening. I'm Jay Diener at 206 Woodland Road in Hampton. Um, I'm here uh, briefly about the aqua proposed Aquarian well, uh, number 22, um, that is they're applying for a permit for. Um, I wasn't able to make it to the public hearing uh, that they had. I had a conflict, but I do have some concerns, and I wanted to express them to you folks as well. Uh, we're on a well. Um, we may be far enough from Aquarian's proposed well that it won't impact us, but I don't know that for a fact. Um, our well is pretty deep. Their well is going to be pretty deep. Um, I don't know, because I'm not a geologist, what impact that may have on our well. Um, our problem is that we not only use our well for household water, uh, we also have a geothermal heating and cooling system that relies on that well. Uh, so if we are impacted by Aquarian's well, I not only lose my household water, I lose my heating and cooling system. And I don't know who pays for that, um, because it's not just a question of hooking up to town water for that. It's a question of having to install a new heating and cooling system. It's not inexpensive. Um, I've been in touch with Aquarian, um, and I've asked them to include our well when they do the monitoring, when they test their proposed new well. Uh, I've relayed my concerns to DES, uh, so they're aware of them. But I wanted to relay them to you as well. Um, this, to me, is, is potentially a major problem. Uh, I hope it's not going to have any impact on our well at all, but I don't know that for a fact. Um, and if it does, I don't know what my recourse is. Um, and I don't know who takes responsibility for the damage done to our property. Um, and I don't know who to go to to get that answer. But I wanted to pass that concern on to you folks so that when you consider your opinions about this well going in, you'll keep that in mind as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Anybody else in the public wishing to be heard? Good evening. Uh, my name is Helen Sorensen, or Helena Sorensen. I've owned property here in Hampton at 7 Green Street for 42 years. And right up until about 12 years ago, when uh, the town of Hampton hired Zopa Construction to redo the water drainage systems, we did have puddles in the streets, like anybody else, but we didn't have floods. We didn't have floods that came up to our knees and surrounding our, water, our homes in that area. Uh, it, the water doesn't drain, it pumps up out of the drainage. So, and I take pictures, I've got pictures going, like I said, probably 12 years or more of the, the water situation. And I've spoken with Mr. Welch and, uh, about this situation. And in the winter when we come to visit our grandkids this past winter, instead of 
plowing snow, I had to come here to the town and ask that the ice that came up out of the sewers, not sewers, but drainage, be plowed away so we didn't kill ourselves trying to get into the property. We had sand in the back of our car, but trying to walk on that kind of ice is almost impossible. So that's, you know, if it's summer and spring, we got floods. Winter, we have solid ice roads over there. And it changed with the tides. The water level as it goes up and down changes everything, but the water level right now, because it's been high, is so saturated, if it rains, it's no place to go. It just sits. And the infestation of mosquitoes, I got bit the first of the May. I had to go to the hospital because I was infected. We went on antibiotics. But anyways, Zopa construction created a problem for us. It was supposed to remedy a problem. Their workmanship here in the town to me was inferior. Their equipment, that they, the things that they did was all inferior. What they promised, they didn't accomplish. I got promises from them in writing that they were going to bring my property back the way it was. I had a macadam, macadam sidewalk in the front of my house. When I got back, it was dirt. They raked up, they dug up my macadam and planted grass seed. So I had no sidewalk. <clears throat> and then I did go to the town. Uh, Dick Violet's the one that contacted them. And we went through back and forth and back and forth. They put it in when I wasn't here in the fall. So it's a patchwork job. It looks like hell. My $2,800 job looks like a kid did it. So that's part of the problem of what Zopa Construction did. They left, up, left us with muddied flood water that comes out of the water drains. It's starting to stink. So when it comes up, it's not just water, it's filth. The filth from the street goes down, and then when the tides come up, it comes back up, and I watch it come up at quarter of four, quarter of five in the morning, it starts rising. And by mid-morning, it's past my mailbox, and if I walk down to Jean Marie's house on the corner of Jenton and Green, I stand in it and I'm up to my knees. And I've taken pictures of that, like I told Mr. Welch. It's not that it's, I'm making it up. I got photos with a yardstick sticking in the water, how far it is. So that's the water that we're dealing with. Today I found out from Mary over there that she has a water drain in front of her house. But it's connected to nothing, nothing. It's just, it's just a, like a hole, right? <clears throat> Am I correct? So you got a water drain that they dug, put in this manhole, and there's nothing that it collects. It's, it's a, like a make-believe tooth or something. You know, nuts. The water that's coming up is, is just devastating, like I said. I went to the hospital the 1st of May to get on bi antibiotics because the, the bug bites that they couldn't tell what it was. I thought it was a tick. They said no, because it was welts like this. Anyways, there's an elderly lady also that lives at the end of the southeast part of Genton that's in a wheelchair. She missed her family wedding this past weekend because she couldn't get out. Just think about it. Here you've got a disabled person down at the end of the street, and if something happens, and, the, and it's going towards the end of the season, nobody's around to help her, heaven help us. I sent letters, I sent emails to every newspaper in the state of New Hampshire this past weekend. Nobody seems to care about us. Right now I haven't had any response, but I'm still waiting, because that was only yesterday, and yesterday was Sunday. The photos I have, I'm sending those out, I called the state, the health department in the state. They said to call the health department here at this town. I spoke with, um, not um, Mr. Schultz, Mr. Schultz, but he said that he wasn't health department, he's building department. So I'm not sure if he is or if he isn't. But there is a health concern here with the standing water. In your ordinance, I went on the internet and looked at your ordinances, and you have one that's seven, 
719 that references standing water five days or more? Well, ours is more than five days. It never goes away. You're supposed to take care of these mosquitoes. Nobody has gone up and down those streets spraying. I hear it, and when I hear it, I run around and I close my windows because that stench, you can't breathe. But at least it kills the mosquitoes. But nothing's been done this summer. Nothing. They just, it's just every man for themselves, by their own spray and heaven help you, what happens? But the health hazard that we're in, letting us, letting us town people, these taxpayers go, go into, is not fair. To live in this water, somebody says, well, move. I don't want to move. I like my chicken coop that I have. <laughs> it's mine. Why don't we hear from the other yeah. people? Yeah. One Hang thing. on a minute. Uh, we're going to have to ask you to wrap it up because it's okay. three minutes. That's okay. But people. that's, that's basically are. what I have. You know, it needs to be fixed. We, the DPW director is going to be in here tonight, and we will discuss it later on in the meeting. And the road is sinking, by the way. Okay. I've yeah. measured sinking the road. everywhere. <laughs> we have some, uh, anybody else Thank in Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I just want to add to some of the comments uh, she made. Uh, my name is Greg Hudak. I live at Two Junction Road. Uh, uh, number one, I want to get to the construction with the sewer. Uh, we used to have a water problem centered uh, in Green Street and Junction. And the water would generally, at the worst, be about six inches. Almost immediately after Ze uh, Zeppo uh, finished up their work, that increased by about 10 inches. And it's been at least that much when it's the highest tides ever since. And I, I don't think it was only on Gentian, but it's a couple spots at Kings Highway have a similar problem, especially around 16th Street and also around 19th Street. Uh, <clears throat> the second item is I've, I've lived in our pro my property for about 40 years. And over the years, we have a very nice view of it because we've got some decks behind the house. And I've noticed that the silt level in the Hampton River is greatly increasing. I am convinced the silt level of that river is one of the biggest problems we have, which, which it really calls for an engineering study to see if that's the case and what can be done about it. And, and because without some factual information from engineers, et cetera, I don't think we know what to do. And so I think that's the request that yes. almost every one of the people that are here from my street are really looking for. Some action, an engineer be hired, study the problem, and address it in some future meetings. I think that's where we stand. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, anybody else wish to be here? Hello, Kathleen Neary, Bergen, Santa Cruz. I own 12 Meadow Pond Road, and um, my family has owned the property at 16 for over 60 years. I own number 12, my sister's own behind me, and another one owns on Green Street. So we're well, well represented down there. Now, first, let me inform you that we have been after the town for several years. But this spring, my sister Virginia Bergen has texted, emailed, written, sent pictures, and I personally have written to every one of you. And let me say, the courtesy of a reply would be appreciated, okay? Now, it's in front of 16 Meadow Pond Road and also on the intersection of the street that we have a drain to nowhere, okay? So that's our false tooth there. The water is ridiculous. The people down Green Street can't walk to the beach anymore. And as far as, you know, it's nice that you're going to have a study, and it's nice that we're going to have engineers. But please, as I said in my letter, if this was your house, there would be action, and the action would be a lot faster than what we're getting. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the public wishing to be heard? Hi there. Um, I'm new to Hampton. My name is Marissa Fantasia. I um, bought a little less than a year ago um, at 20 Gentian Road. Um, it was always my dream to live at the beach. You know, it's a beautiful place. I fell in love with Hampton pretty easily because of all the wonders. Um, it's a real bummer 
this water problem. It's hard to have people at my dream home. It's hard to walk to the beach. I'm a year-round resident, so I have actually trudged through that ice and sleet and mess to go to my job, which is I'm essential personnel, I'm a nurse, so I don't have the option of working at home. Um, so I would really appreciate to have something be done about this. I mean, we, I agreed to come here and live like a wonderful life and pay my taxes, and I would really appreciate if you guys could step it up, tell us what the problem is, and what we're gonna do to fix it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else in the public wishing to be heard? I, I just wanted to say one thing about the mosquitoes. If anyone that has problems with the mosquitoes should be, do they call Dragon Direct or they call this mosquito? They call Dragon Direct. Yeah, they, you should call Dragon Mosquito. Dragon Mosquito. I've never been told anything Well, like that. that's standard. That That's what you need to do. The they will come and go and, and do a spray in your neighborhood. Is that number available through the town? Yes. Probably. Yes. Go ahead, ma'am. I, I don't have much of a voice, so I'll be brief. My name is Madeline Lynch. I live at 8 Green Street, and my family has owned this property for longer than I've been alive. And, you know, I agree with what most of the neighbors have said. It's never been this bad. I don't know what has happened with the tides and global warming and whatever you want to blame it on. It has never been to this excess where the water's up to your knees in this past spring when it had rained a considerable amount of time the water was up to your knees when you go out there not i'm not kidding um, and it doesn't go away i mean the water table is always high which you would expect in a marsh area or close to the seacoast but it never goes away we're getting to the point now where you go out there on a perfectly dry day and the street itself may be dry as rarely as that happens and you're still sinking into the mud in your front yard. I mean, I've done a considerable amount of work this year, spent a lot of money to try to grade the, my front yard, put in gravel to try to alleviate the situation. And it hasn't even got, it hasn't gotten any better. It's only gotten worse. So you've got a neighborhood of at least 20, 22 people houses that are severely affected by this because the water is in their front yards and the the rest of the neighbors are probably you know another 40 or 50 homes where you're collecting what a quarter of a million dollars in taxes every year from homeowners that earnestly want to live there and have occupied their homes in this neighborhood for a very long time so what i would like to see from the town is some action you know, it's been going on for too long, and maybe we haven't been vocal enough, but we're here now because it's gotten to an extreme that we feel it needs to be addressed by the town. If not the town, because it's a marsh and it's a wetland, do we have any recourse with the state of New Hampshire? There, the state of New Hampshire has done studies on the marsh back in 2005. They did a study and made recommendations on what should be done to the marsh to try to alleviate some of the flooding issues at that time. Don't, I don't think any of those things were done. The only comment I saw was there was no money. So where's the money? And where does that need to come from? Is it the state? You know, is it environment, an environmental arm of the state to protect the marsh? We value the marsh. It's part of our ecosystem as well. So we're not saying that, you know, it's unfortunate that our neighborhoods are flooded, but the marsh has to be protected as well as our home values as well. Thank, Thank you, very, you much. very much. Anybody else wishing to be heard? <clears throat> uh, the DPW director is going to be in, and we will bring up that we're not ignoring the public comment. And during public comment, we don't respond to people. It's just public comment. But we will bring it up during when the DPW comes in uh, for his uh, appointment, and the manager's report will talk about it. So, and I'm not saying we'll have a solution for you, but we will discuss it. So anybody that wants to stay and listen until he gets here, you're welcome to do that. Or you can watch us on Channel 22 uh, either way. But we will make some discussion on this tonight. I, I, we will not have a solution. I'm absolutely sure of that. But we will have discussion. So that's what I can say for right now. 
Uh, moving on, announcements and community calendar. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I would just like to say that these folks have their concern, and there's also another huge concern going on, which I wasn't going to bring up tonight because I think they'd want to come in and talk to the board as well. Down on, you know, uh, I was talking to five or six residents on Manchester Street down off Ashworth Ave uh, this weekend. Same thing. They've lived there 40, 50 years, got their places from their parents, took them over. They've always had a problem. They know the tide's rising, but something's going on. All right, so something does need to be done. Like Jim said, we're not going to have a, we're not going to be able to figure it out tonight. But like you said, we go to the state. We have to, we go federal. But right now we have people that have been paying taxes in this town for 40 or 50 years who are losing their foundations are literally getting ripped away from their houses. I mean, it's it's you, it goes all the way, and I'm sure it goes all the way down to Seabrook Bridge. I know I live off Wanakunit. I know there's some condos there. I think uh, Mr. Bean has some problems behind his house. There's something that needs to be done. So. Believe me, I'm not going to ignore the problem, and I'm going to. I want to work with everyone. Public works, but it's a real issue. People are paying taxes, and their houses are literally getting ripped out from under them. Something needs to be figured out. Whoever we have to go to, we got to go to. Public announcement, Mr. Barrow. Yes, I, uh, I was. <coughs> excuse me. I was called by Dave Harnett. Um, they are having, as they did last year, a. Uh, Police and Firefighter Appreciation Cookout on June 28th at 6:30 <laughs> at their uh, the main sale, and they uh, they asked if there's any of the uh, other beach businesses that want to come down and meet some of the police and firefighters or the board here. They he extended that uh, invitation to them too. So I know last year I went to that. I think. You did, Rusty. Yep. I think other members did, and it's, it's really a good way to get down there and meet some of the part-time people that are going to be on the beach for the summer and, and let them know who we are and that we support them. So it's a, it's a really good time. Meet them at a time when you don't need them. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good time. Mr. Griffin. Um, no, Dave called me also, and I was going to say that he uh, extended the invitation to all the people on the board. Mr. Bean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, there, there were selectmen down at uh, Gentian today, and uh, the, the emails have been forwarded and channeled. And I know this is a, it's coming up later, but uh, and these are town roads primarily and town infrastructure. The, the property, of course, is uh, the integrity <coughs> of those is being impugned. However, uh, these, these are town roads. Mr. Welch uh, and uh, Public Works are going to be on it, but uh, it, 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 it's startling when you go down there on a sunny morning and see the depth of the water and, and the health hazard that it represents. And uh, yeah, uh, I don't know anything about engineering, uh, and I don't know anything about construction. I know Mr. Welch does, and Public Works does, and, and uh, as, as Mr. Uh, Modell has said, uh, the uh, Board of Selectmen and Town Leadership is pledged to a, a way forward uh, in this that mitigates and changes uh, that today. That was really striking. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. <clears throat> uh, consent agenda. Conservation Commission alternate appointment, Steve Scaroto. Dance hall permit, Cloud 9 Bar and Grill, 225 Ocean Boulevard, Hampton Beach Casino, 169 Ocean Boulevard, Casino Mini Golf, 169 Ocean Boulevard, Mac Restaurant Group 9A, Ocean Boulevard, Entertainment License, the Victorian Inn and Pavilion, 430 High Street, License for co coin-operated amusement devices, Funorama Casino Building, DM Sales, 225 Ocean Boulevard, request for no objection, JB's Seafood, 187 Ocean Boulevard for liquor service outdoors, parade and public gathering licenses, Children's Festival Parade, 081817, Seafood Festival, 090817 to 091117, one day entertainment license, Place Cove Beach, Drunicki, Drunick, wedding, 91617, use of town property, Place Cove Beach, for the wedding again, 91617, Place Cove parking lot, requesting six parking spaces for the wedding. RSA 42-14-A, modification of deed restrictions, vote on RSA 41 Colon 14-A, Proceedings, Amend and Release Town Owed Deeds Restriction on Formerly Leased Land. Diane Crabtree and Douglas 
P. Douglas Gearson, 751 Ocean Boulevard, and Michael and Kelly Sexton, 434 Third Street, release of deed restriction number four, the only structures permitted to be erected and placed upon said lot shall be one single family dwelling to allow two free, two freestanding one family dwellings. So moved. Uh, seconded. seconded. All in favor? Okay, the consent calendar passes. Approval of minutes, June 5th, 2017, public session and non-public session. The June 5th minutes. Second. By Regina and seconded by Rusty. All in favor? June 12th, 2017 minutes. Public session. Make the motion. Regina. Seconded Second. by Rusty. All in favor? Okay. Ellen Lavin, Town Treasurer. First appointment. Tan closing documents. Good evening. Good evening. I was here about a month ago uh, to obtain authorization to borrow $4 million TAN. Um, as you know, we went out to Provident Bank, and that came back with an interest rate of 2.65. It does expire at the end of the year, uh, December 29. It would have to be paid back. What I have tonight is the note. I have two, um, they call it a rider. It's a line of credit. They call it a line of credit. So I borrow as I need, and then I pay it back. And then we also have a certificate, which states that we had a meeting that you authorized that I could go out and borrow the $4 million. So what I need are these to be signed, and then they go back to um, bond council tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Just to be a favor, just mm -hmm. explain again. I know you explained it last time, but just so that anybody listening or anybody listen, uh, on TV or anything, what TAN is, and when you say borrowing $4 million, it's a, uh, it's a tax anticipation note. So I am fine right now. The taxes are due, obviously, July 3rd. I have enough money. But between now and the end of the year, depending on if there are emergencies and we need to expend money that we are not planning for, I may have to borrow. So what this does is give me the authorization to borrow on the TAM. And then, as I say, it is, it is issued only to December 29th. At that point, it would have to be paid back. Okay. And as taxes come in, that's how you pay it back, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Do we need a vote on that? Yes, sir. Yes. Could I have a motion by somebody? I'll make a motion that we sign the document. Second. Okay, all in favor? Unanimous? Great, thank you. Uh, tomorrow, what I will also do is uh, Jane actually has to um, put the town seal. Right. So that will be done before the note. We'll go back to Bonnie Bacon at Providence, and then the rest of the paperwork will go to Renault at the Biden Okay. Which is Bond Council. They have to approve it. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, why don't we go, as we're doing this, we'll go to the next appointment. Next appointment has requested uh, to be moved to July 24th. Could not be here this evening. Okay. And so let's go to Commissioner Kevin St. James, Rockingham County. Rockingham County budget. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I apologize. I didn't send it till this um, late morning. I sent the budget over electronically. Did it? Was everyone able to get it? Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a quick overview of Rockingham County. I represent, as a commissioner, uh, 17 towns and the one city of Portsmouth in Rockingham County, which is made up of 37 towns. Its, um, its government is three commissioners, myself in this region, Tom Tom Burrell in the southern part, and uh, Kevin Coyle in the center part of Rockingham County. And we are the commissioners, we hold executive powers in Rockingham County, but the state representatives from those 37 towns make up the delegation. The delegation makes up the legislative body of Rockingham County, so they're the ones that actually set the um, tax rate. Um, with that said, just a quick overview of our budget. The good news was this year we had a 0.48% increase 
in our budget for a total budget of $81,086,953. Um, and the bad news is because we're doing some projects, revenues in the nursing home is uh, down by $5 million. So the overall tax impact to the towns is a 3.10% increase. But what I want to do is come over here. Hampton is the fourth largest payer to Rockingham County. And I thought it'd be nice for you to know exactly what we do with your money. And if you have any questions about it, to at least answer those. Um, so with our budget this year, I mean, Rockingham County provides a lot of services to the towns that people don't think of. Number one, we, um, by state RSAs, we're responsible for all the elderly in Rockingham County, whether they're in our nursing home or they go to another nursing home. And how that works is it's called categorical assistance. So someone from Rockingham County goes to a nursing home, whether it's in Maine or Massachusetts, we still have to pay a portion of it. Right? And that makes up like $20 million of our budget. Then as well as the elderly, we, we have to house prisoners. So we have a, a jail. Um, and the cost in our jail is roughly $100 a day to house an inmate. And with that, we have to include all medical as well as meals for them. Um, along with the jail comes the county attorney's office, which prosecutes all felon felony level cases in Rockingham County. And we're the second, we're actually the largest courthouse, so do the most work, because Hillsborough is the second, is the largest county, but they're split between two courthouses. Uh, we have a sheriff's department that transports prisoners, patrols streets, provides dis dispatch for 18 fire departments and 25 police departments in Rockingham County. Uh, we also have um, uh, the Brentwood uh, facility, the county complex. So we have an engineer and maintenance team that does that. Um, and between all that, we have over 650 employees in Rockingham County. So there's a finance office and an HR office with that. Um, last year's or this year's budget, what we ended up doing was that included, we negotiated seven union contracts with our correctional offices, sheriffs, maintenance, and um, legal assistance. Uh, so they all got their contractual raises, and we did a 2% increase across the board for all non-union workers in Rockingham County. Um, there was three new positions this year approved. Two of them are county attorney's office. Uh, Full-time attorneys who are going to start uh, in another couple of months because the state is switching over what's called felons first. So if someone is arrested in Hampton on a felony charge right now, it goes to your local prosecutor handles it until it gets handed up to Rockin up to the Superior Court. Now what's going to happen is it's automatically going to go to the county attorney's office. So it'll take that step out, um, and then there's one full-time administrative assistant that's going to the county attorney's office as well because of the felons for us program. So there's only three new positions. Um, our revenue, like I said, was down in the nursing home because we're doing a $12 million remodel at the nursing home. One whole wing of our nursing home was a little bit institutional. There was four beds in the room with no bathroom. Um, it, was, it was time for a remodel. Uh, so what we're doing is those are being redone to two beds in a room with a common bathroom, each one. Uh, it was much needed. And then as well as that, we're redoing two other floors in there. But the $12 million was made up of a $3 million bond, $8 million taken out of our fund balance, and $1 million increase on, on your tax rate. But that will be completed by spring of 2018. Um, and... Revenues of deed, uh, registered deeds, which brings in money to the county, we're anticipating they'll be up 800000 in their revenues. And that pretty much takes up that. If you look at the budget itself, you'll see some increases under the delegation, which is made up of the state reps again. Uh, we had a fire training school for a long time at the Brentwood Drill Yard, which trained a lot of the firefighters in this area. Turns out they were using a Class A foam that is now proven to be um, contaminating, and we have a contamination problem on our property. We have PFOAs, the same thing as um, St. 
Gobins in Merrimack, and the same thing that Pease is fighting as well. So we just found out about that this year, so we had to put some money in the budget to start. Could you explain what POFA is? Polyfluoro. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I should <laughs> so know it by now. What's a chemical? Now. Say it. It's, it's, it's a bad chemical that's okay. kind of Teflon in water, um, but it's the exact same thing. It's, it comes down to um, solvents that we use um, over at Peas, as well as foams that, was, that fire departments have used for years, Class A foams that they've used. Um, and unfortunately, there's a training facility, so they use lots of foam to train with it. Uh, no one knew it was contaminating, but we're working to get that cleaned up. Um, there's an increase in the treasurer's budget uh, because we gave him a salary increase for the first time in, I believe, uh, six years. Uh, county attorneys, because there's three new positions that we talked about earlier. The sheriff department, uh, because of the way we lease our payments, there was there's a bump this year in the, in the lease. Uh, the commissioners, um, our budget is up because of the projects that I talked about. We're doing a $12 million re, um, remodel, so that bumped our line up. Um, you'll see IT services, that the budget went up, but if you look at other departments under IT, what we did was we consolidated. We had each department doing their own IT services and buying their own software, and obviously everything's cheaper by the dozen, so we combined it up. So that's why that looks up, but it's down in everyone else's budget. And uh, for human resources, for the first time, we're trying to get out of paper filing so that you can do your applications online, we can do our evaluations for employees online, and we can track um, raises and salary adjustments online. But the other thing we did with this year um, was the first time in 12 years we did a pay and salary study. It was much needed to bring us up to standards on that. Um, I would ask if you have any questions. It was a kind of a quick overview. Start with, uh, okay, Rick. Uh, how much do the commissioners make? Uh, the commissioners make 18000 a year. Yeah, because just a few years ago it was 12000 uh, Not that long ago. Before my time, but I'm not sure when it went up. That what um, it is is the delegation sets the pay rates. Uh, but I would state that Rockingham County doesn't have an administrator. We are actually working commissioners. Uh, all the other counties have an administrator. Rockingham does not have one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just say, though, um, and maybe we, we could check it out, it was 12000 for for, I believe, many years. It was. Um, and now it's 18000 I just wanted to point out that the Board of Selectmen, we've never raised them. <laughs> In the 15, the 12 years I've been here, in fact, it was more on the 12th year, it was, it's less today. Is that a motion? Just to throw that out. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very controversial. No, 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 I'm not suggesting that, but I'm just showing you how it works in this town and how it works there. I agree. I was a state rep before, and I got paid $200 for two years' service. And the delegation does their, you know, like I said, they had a legislative body. but it's And it's an elected position, and this is what's, what must be happening. Elected officials must be getting more money, <laughs> just like the workers, I guess. Just throwing Anything that else? out there. Anything else? No. Mr. Bean. Uh, County government does an extraordinary job for uh, many of uh, those that are in need. Uh, and thanks for what you do up there. It's not an easy job, uh, and uh, we really appreciate it. You do a lot for people that are uh, senior citizens. You do a lot for folks uh, that um, are coming out of uh, uh, our law enforcement agencies. And uh, um, no one else is going to do it. So, so thank you for what you do. It's a beautiful facility and uh, that you're reinvesting in up there in the uh, nursing home. So thank you. Appreciate it. I totally agree with that. Regina? Um, I have a question. So are you you're gonna change your fiscal year end? Is that that's a definite now? Yes, that passed the legislative. Yeah. Okay. So what was happening before was we were our fiscal year was a calendar year. Right? Yeah. And the problem with that is to be honest, you're freshly elected in November and then all of a sudden you're already through the budget process. Yeah. So the newly elected people have no say in the budget. You're kind of relying on people that have been either un that weren't elected or relying on someone else. Um, so we are switching to a uh, June through July fiscal year, and that's going to start coming. This our next budget cycle come November will be an 18-month budget to get us on that. 
Okay. Right? <coughs> um, there was some worries with towns of how we would build the towns. Right now, the way we build the towns out, we send you a bill in November. All right, so you have the whole year for that. Uh, our current plan is to keep it that way. We're not going to change anything. So you're not going to get a bill for 18 months. Okay. You, you, you're not, you're going to get, you're not going to see anything change yet. Okay. Um, we, we've talked about possibly going to a biannual billing, but it would be, this, it, it, again, you would never be paying in advance. Uh, but that's that was only talked just to see on what we're doing. I failed to mention, I don't know if you saw, we are having hosting a meeting this Wednesday for all the town managers and select boards uh, to get a chance to sit down at a round table to talk about that possible scenario or anything else that Rockingham County can do for the towns. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Rusty. So you're right now your revenue's down from the nursing home. Correct. Um, is that a short-term thing you expect once yes, it gets done? That. You're gonna because right now I'm sure you're, you're down residents right now. We're, exactly, we're down 44 beds. Okay. We're down 44. We're, physically, that wing is shut down for 44 beds, so that's the, that's the difference. But when we reopen, because we're changing from four beds to room to two beds, we're going to be down 24 beds. But the difference is we will have a nicer facility that we can take private pay versus just you know um, indigent people. We could do rehabilitation services. Is there any is there any thought or discussion down the road for increasing your bed amount with through additions or? At this time, we're just trying to get our. Like I said, it was kind of institutional. Some of the places we had, it was time to change that. We had a lot of land at Rockingham County that, if the need ever rose, right now what we're fighting is Medicaid managed care. Uh, the, the state is trying to, we have to, they put it on the onus on county government to come up with a new model on how they're going to manage care. And if we don't do it, they're going to hand it to the insurance companies, and the insurance company is going to decide what happens with our residents. And no one, not any town, not any commissioner, not any legislator is going to be able to dictate where people go. And the insurance company is going to say, you're going to go over here or there, and it's going to take all everything out from the... So we're trying to work diligently with the um, legislative body to try and come up with a form of managed care. Thank you, Kevin. Fred, do you have anything you want to add? Or? No, I just make sure the check goes out of here all right. on time. <laughs> the only thing, if I could just add that I forgot to mention is... Um, we do have a program with our trustees for the correctional, and they were here um, a couple of years ago shoveling hydrants in the dead of winter. Uh, that current that program is still current, where at no cost of the town, short of feed them a, a, a pizza or a sub, we will bring a crew of anywhere from eight to ten prisoners with a correctional officer watch them to do any special projects. We have re-roofed a highway shed in Raymond. We built the highway shed in Auburn. We built a police station in Sandown. They just painted a building last week in Newton, New Hampshire. They painted the inside of the fire station in Kingston, New Hampshire. If you have any projects, I would recommend you get a hold of Major Dave Constantino at the correction, or get a hold of me, and we could get a crew over here to do any special projects that you, you know, really don't do. The only thing that's going to cost you is the materials. Other than that, the labor is free. Buy a sandwich, and you don't even have to watch them because it comes with the person. And we're in the process of securing a new vehicle for the corrections department so that we can send a road crew out just to pick up trash. And that would be just driving through Rockingham County, stopping at a road, picking up trash along the And that wouldn't, you know, require anything out of the town. It's just that you'll see a van with a sign saying, your tax dollars at work, and prisoners picking up trash. When, when is that round table again? This Wednesday at 5.30 at the county complex. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate you coming in. Kevin. Appreciate your... Uh... If you ever have any questions, don't hesitate to call us. I know people kind of forget about county government, but we're there and we're willing to do anything we can. And we do have a central bidder, uh, a central purchaser. If the town wants to take advantage, East Kingston buys their electricity with us through their bidding. Um, you know, we all use copy paper, toilet paper, that stuff. We have a little bit bigger buying power. Um, so don't don't forget about that. If, if there's anything we can do to help you on your central buying. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks for coming in. Okay. Next, Ed Tinker, Chief Assessor.
Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Good. Um, tonight, I'm presenting the final 13 abatements for 2016. Um, of those, seven have been uh, recommended for approval, totaling $12,547.23. Six, the other six abatements are uh, recommended to be denied. Um, if you have any questions regarding them, I can answer those for you. Gina? Uh, total of $12,547.23. Correct. Yeah, I make the motion that we uh, go with your recommendation. Second. Okay, and just for discussion, Rusty, do you have any? All set. Thank you. Bill, do you have any? Negative, sir. Thank you. Okay. What's kind of the average abatement rebate that, that you know, the whole the, the whole thing's 12000 you said? Yes, there was a couple of commercial um, abatements that were larger than a residential ones, of course. Okay. Um, um, I did submit also the uh, entire list. Yep. Uh, it doesn't include interest to date. I'll get that one so they're all processed from the tax collector. Um, but it shows for this year the total of expended on abatements. Uh, it broken out by residential, commercial, and utility properties. So you have those totals separated. Yep. Um, once we get the uh, total refunds uh, filled in, I can get a copy of this to to okay. the board. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have a motion. We have a second. Uh, all in favor? Unanimous. All right. Thank you. Do you have anything else for us? That's it. Thank you. Nice seeing you. Yep. <laughs> uh, next, Chris Jacobs, DPW director, and Jen Hale. Are they here? They're upstairs, I believe. They must be on their way. Should we have a band when you guys come in or something? You know, a little music? <laughs> yeah, you, you know, like, uh, yeah, the Tonight Show. As long as there's cymbals, drums, mariachis. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, well, you have a couple of things on yours first, and then we have a couple of things probably to ask you. So. Yeah, okay. Start with the engineering study agreement with Unitil. Sure. Go ahead. That's uh, Jennifer's been coming. So, and I apologize for not being here last time to answer your questions, but I did hear uh, some feedback comment last time that we were looking for a better defined scope. And really, what is it that the money is being given to Unitil for? Um, and, and what do we get for that? So there's been two rounds. So in front of you is a cover letter, uh, and the Unitil contract that uh, was for $180,000. That is all related to what is really needs to be defined, and I've gone back and defined it even more, so a little of this is going to be discussion. It's sort of two phases to what uh, the intentions are. The intentions in working with Unitil and eventually the other utility companies is looking at what is the feasibility? What are those options? of uh, removing the overhead utility wires to some other configuration. So whether it's from the rear of some of the properties, whether it's underground, whether it's a combo of two, it's truly trying to figure out what is it that we're going to do can it be done. Again, the word feasible in a feasibility study is, is it possible? What are the costs associated with it? And um, being able to use that information for your next steps. So that's really what this stage one is. So I went back to Unitil again after I provided this uh, for the board, and so here's my apology for having new information that you don't have in front of you. And I said, John, this is John over at Unitil, I said, can you explain to me the breakdown of the 180,000? Is Unitil using all of this money because originally, the 180000 as it spells here, was these feasibility study and construction documents. So it was taking one of those chosen, if we went forward, putting into construction documents that you would put out to the street and you would bid, and all the design and specifications, so the engineering that would go with it. I said, well, that makes it really confusing, since we don't know which way we're going. We don't know what solution we're going for. I said, what is the cost for moving forward with this feasibility part. What are our options? What land would we need? What easements? Those type of things. 
So John sent me back the cost for that, and that's 32500 So as a recommendation, I don't suggest we move forward with the $180,000, as my letter said, because we don't know which way we're moving forward. But to move forward with the feasibility component, which is trying to determine can we, can we have an option to put wires underground from the back in some other configuration that exists today? What would that cost? And then let Experience Hampton do what they had said they were going to do, look for funding, look for ways to accomplish that. But to use the money that was approved through the warrant process to look and do that feasibility study and that money to Unitil for, which is now a revised $32,000. So I apologize that didn't come to you the first time. It took some while to get myself caught up on what was going on. But I feel like we've called them, we've uh, worked it out, and I needed to explain that to you. So I hope I've just explained that a little bit better. All right, open up the discussion in the board. Uh, Phil, do you want to? You want me to rain on the parade first? Sure. Um, yeah. uh, look, I get the warrant article process, and I, I get uh, the town warrant, and, and this thing here. So this is a, a an engineering study agreement, and it's titled "A Town of Hampton Downtown Underground." Underground. That's, that's the title of the agreement. That's what they're looking at, looking at putting utilities downtown. Yeah, it's, it's it's kind of generic and, and for me problematic, and we we as a board spoke at the last. About uh, for costs, and I don't think this document uh, satisfies that that standard any more than where we were at the last time, and uh, it raises more questions than it answers now. Uh, and again, I understand there was a warrant, and I understand that I voted for it. Um, and, and here it is. It's, it's, it's got in the first subparagraph. There's four things: provide a scope and cost estimate of all labor and materials to remove the electrical facilities in the affected area. That is the responsibility of the company. Um, I'm a layman, but I, you know, I have a business. Uh, Jim has been in business. Me and some of the rights been in business. People have a, a pretty good feel for what those things cost. And I think Unitil, uh, you say they're a monopoly for electric around here. Is that correct? They are. Yeah, I think supply. they. I think they have a pretty good feel for that without charging um, their only captive customer. And I'm just going to go on for a couple of things and get to it, um, uh, including but not limited to an existing condition survey information and AutoCAD drawings of civil engineering of the affected area. That's our responsibility. Is this states? Is that and correct? We've already had that done. Okay. So we've got that. How much did that cost us? Twenty-eight thousand. All right, twenty-eight thousand. Is that twenty-eight thousand out of the three hundred thousand? Yes. That's already been. Did we sign a? Uh, uh, we brought order? before two proposals. We had solicited two proposals, survey proposals, and we had gone with. Okay. Uh, so important to note, Phil, though, and I don't mean to interrupt, but yeah. not just for this. Right. That survey is for our sewer design or drainage design. Okay. And so, what portion of that uh, twenty-eight thousand is uh, a portion? You don't have to answer it right now. To this three hundred thousand dollar limit, I don't see that. Um, and then it says there's going to be two to three conceptual designs. Is it two or is it three? A third uh, more, a third less. I think that's a big issue, especially when you're talking people uh, are looking at $180,000. That's a huge thing, two or three, one or two. Now, is it three or is it two? Is it 180 grand for three or is it 120 grand for two? Uh, it also talks about land rights to be procured. Now we're getting into eminent domain. Now we're getting into attorneys. Uh, I could be wrong. I know a little bit about real estate, not that much. But when we're talking land rights to be procured, um, that to me uh, sounds serious. All they'd be doing is identifying what we, we actually are not, or we're year, or months away from actually trying to procure, but. In other words, their conceptual designs, be they okay. two or three, would identify, well, we need an easement on this parcel, we need an easement on this parcel, we need a taking on this parcel. Okay. Um, In the I, end, these things may prove to be very problematic. And, and, and I'm going to defer to uh, Mr. Welch on these things and the town attorney, of course, um, but land rights and uh, takings in eminent domain are serious issues. And then it says an order of magnitude cost estimates. This is under stage one after they'd be procured by the customer. And that means the town is going to be responsible for taking these, not not uh, experience Hampton, not the Hampton Chamber. This is the 
customer, and that's the town. So we will be involved in takings, and Mr. Welch, I'll defer to you. But then it says, and order of magnitude cost estimates. What is that? That's so we get an understanding that when they do the concepts two or three, what would they cost to actually implement, to construct? Right. So okay. we can determine if it's feasible. Okay. And then um, stage two, uh, the con it will include construction plans to be provided to the customer's contractor. Uh, so this is the construction documents. If it's, if it's proven feasible and if there's funding available, they would then provide the construction drawings to a contractor. So many state, like way beyond now, which is why I don't think moving forward with the 180 is appropriate because you're not there. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm going uh, to so defer. So that's what you just said. Yeah, to the rest of the board. I feel exactly the same way. I don't think it's anywhere near precise enough. But she does feel confident moving forward, forward with the 32. 32. Because that's what gives us the cost to determine if it's feasible, right. what the options be. It would identify hurdles. It would identify if there were land constraints or easements that were needed so that uh, I, I want to call it the educated decision. It would answer questions as to, you know, Unitil would own, you know, primary, primary, excuse me, primary lines, you know, if okay. it were constructed. So I think that there's some of these things are let, exactly let me, what you're let me just for. Let me just get out so the rest of the board, but on, on the June 20th letter, I don't see anything about, I, maybe I'm going blind. No, I, I, don't I see, didn't have it. I don't see anything about 32,000. <laughs> I didn't have it then. I don't see anything about that and the detailed stuff, and I'm, I'm not sorry. going anywhere near it. That's right to Thank respond you. to your thing. Yeah. No, I'm back to the chamber. Thank you. I'd like Fred to respond to what he just said. Okay, well, let's go to the board first and then yeah. go to Fred. I think I see the 180000 and then I see this. Right, and that was my apology. And this is the whole what they're supposed to do from start to beginning. We've already paid for 28000 of it because we had to do a certain part of it. No. no. And again, I'm going to have to take full responsibility here because I went to further clarify after the deadline of giving you this. What you have in front of you is 180,000, which would take it from the feasibility, the, de the conceptual designs, that right. stage one, like you see there, yeah. through construction drawings once things were decided. My further refinement in why I'm saying, why are we gonna go in to pay for constructions and specifications and those type of things? Let's do, this study, let's find out what it would cost and what our options are. And I found out that number after what's in front of you, so you right. do not have it. And that is the 32,500. It's basically stage one <coughs> on so, that little thing. So my cover letter that you have on top of Unitil's thing does not explain right. what I've explained to you tonight. So would it be possible to get something from Unitil that shows what will be done for the 32,500 yeah, study. It, it's going to be okay. those, um, it, it makes yes. sense for me right. to refine it, and the answer is yes. Okay. Thank you. And the whole intent of the Warren article was for a feasibility study, if I... Yes, because the final construction and, you know, the, the final, final plan and the actual doing the work is, you know, experiences Hampton has said that they're going to be responsible for raising the funds for that. So this really is just a feasibility. So, and this is just, say, phase one. Phase one. Of seeing what the feasibility is yeah. without having to buy all the plans. Right. It, it, yes. And after this, they may come back and say to you the, the cost to do option one is 1.5 million, option two is two and a quarter, and option combination of one and two, which is the option three, is 3.3 million. Which one would you like to do? And it's up to Experience Hampton to raise the funds, and if they don't, you get the <coughs> plug on the whole thing. Because as Phil has Mr. Bean pointed out, it, it is a contract with the town and Unitel, ultimately. I would like to uh, speak. Okay, go. Um, I'd like Fred to respond to uh, what Phil said. And I would also like to know, uh, how did this work over at Exeter when they d determined that they could not afford to put the uh, utilities underground? 
did that happen or did the people over there vote not to do it? But I know that they were planning on putting the utilities underground and in the end they decided, I think at a cost of over four million, it was too much. Um, and the other thing I'd like to know more about what happened of, of the idea of putting the utilities out on the train tracks or back there. That'd be one of those options. Okay. Yeah. There are a number of options to do this, obviously. <clears throat> the reason you're getting 32500 in front of you tonight is because I had a long conversation with Public Works, and there are a number of things here that haven't been settled yet. First of all, we don't even know if we have a route that we can use because no one has even talked to the people along Lafayette Road to find out whether or not we can go behind those buildings, either overhead or underground. And they may not all have to be gone behind. It's, it's a matter of uh, one person can stop the whole process if they say no. They don't want to give an easement. By law, utilities cannot enjoy the use of someone's private property except by easement. That's a state law. So we need to we need to sort of get through that, and the thirty-two thousand five hundred dollars will satisfy that one of those requirements to find out exactly whether or not it's feasible to put those <coughs> overhead or underground down behind existing properties, or whether or not uh, they can be put underground uh, down Lafayette Road. As you know, we have a lot of utilities on Lafayette Road, and we'll have to work amongst them in order to get an underground line, and if that's where it needs to go, I think that uh, you'll never get an answer to the question if you don't do this. But we need to make sure, if it's done, that the answer to the question comes back for no more than $32,500. That's a lot of money to spend for something that you're going to own, we're going to build, and we're going to have to own and maintain it forever. Because at the meeting when Unitel described this, they're not going to maintain the system. They're not going to own it. The town is. Unless they change that position, we're going to be in the electric distribution business. That's, that's the bottom line here. I don't know how much this system will cost, and, and neither does anyone else until they actually out, go out and do the survey. So in order to get answers to all these different questions, for instance, what size conduit do you need? Uh, do you need 12-inch conduit? Do you need 15-inch conduit for 13,500-volt cable, three-phase? Uh, you know, what if they're running 4650? <coughs> what if they're running 7600? There are a whole number of issues that need to be resolved here. And how are they going to run them? Is there going to be pole lines behind existing properties coming down uh, um, Lafayette Road? Or if people won't allow that, do they have to actually take an easement and excavate down behind all those properties? But that's what the feasibility that's study... That's what the feasibility study will tell you, all the answers to all these various questions, so you'll have a general idea of what's going on here and whether or not you can, you can proceed in any one fashion or a number of fashions to get the work done if the town decides to do it. Okay. But I'm going to ask, is the board will allow John Nyan to speak because Experience Hampton is involved in this. They wrote the Warren article. They're going to raise the money. If that's permissible... Anybody got an objection? Yeah, I do. Anybody else? Does he live in Hampton? John Nine? Yeah. yeah. John Nine, yeah. And here, here's the reason I don't is uh, this is a Warren article, and this is dealing with public works, and this is dealing with the Board of Selectmen. This is dealing with the town attorney. These are deeded rights. Uh, John Nine doesn't have an expertise in that. I don't have an expertise in that. Uh, but Mr. Welch does, Public Works does. We're in here tonight, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last week we asked for, for greater detail. There's been some um, good reasons that Jen doesn't have some things here today. And let me get that right on the record, that no one would argue with. And God bless you, young lady. Uh, and we asked for more detail. Now we're talking about $32,000 without a description, without anything written. We got a $180,000 cover letter, and uh, we've got an engineering study that's raising more questions than it asks. So Mr. Nyan can add to the confusion, but I'll tell you, as a business owner and a guy that supported the Warren article, uh, it's gone from bad to worse, and I would like this to start off in a much better, more professional manner. Thank I'll you. i make a motion that we allow John Nyan to speak. No second. All in favor? I just want to discuss it. Uh, I would like to say uh, that I don't have any problem with John speaking, and I hope he can stay and to listen uh, as a, the head of the Hampton Area Commission to listen to the, what we're going to discuss that has to do with this Gentian Road, because that area is something that 
is under the whatever of the Hampton Area Commission. So I hope John can stay. And then let me just ask, would you like to speak? <laughs> sure. <laughs> just for the record, uh, on this part of the conversation, John Nyan to Walnut Avenue in Hampton, so I can live in Hampton. And um, my role t tonight in speaking is the president of Experience Hampton. Um, I had no intentions of coming up to speak um, after having f further discussions with uh, members of the management team of Public Works. Um, we have been going back and forth in discussions uh, in as much as that they have kept Experience Hampton up to date on what the plans are, which I think has been very appreciative. Um, when they uh, shared with us um, that they thought and, and Jen thought that uh, before we go any further, let's, uh, let's really break down that 180000 and she came up with uh, working and negotiating with Unitil that $32,000, which is the fees ability study and I think that's that was the intent from the very very beginning of experience Hamptons idea was the fact that is it possible to do what we would like to do <coughs> a lot of people say yes a lot of people say no but the only way you're gonna find it as as mr. Welch said is through this feasibility study to determine once and for all is something like this doable and possible that's why we went out and raised the money uh, I should say through the Warren article to see what can be done on this and also made a financial commitment to that Warren article uh, on behalf of Experience Hampton. So that's all I have to say and um, you know I, I do uh, support uh, Jen's uh, idea of the, the, the new recommendation um, and I think I can speak for Experience Hampton. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Rusty. So Jen, we're not looking for the 180. Correct. We're looking for thirty-two five. Right. Thirty-two thousand five hundred. And you have that in writing. Yes. Is the board seen? Is the board seen it? We have not seen it. Yes. And may I, may I, Mr. Chairman? Yes. We've got a twenty-eight thousand dollar expenditure that we've got no allocation of costs associated with this project. Now we're starting to climb, which could be upwards of fifty thousand dollars. We don't have any documentation on this thirty-two thousand. It's a verbal, and it's not the way to do business. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Fred, your recommendation? Uh, I'd like to see the contract. I'm the one who's going to sign it. Uh, I'd like I mean, to know what the, I'm going to sign. As the director, I'd like to table this matter for another week. I have Jen uh, expand upon the uh, uh, proposal, uh, attach to it the documentation she has from Unitil. Yeah. I don't think, uh, you know, certainly the project, the lines aren't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, let's. Uh, I would agree with uh, Selectman Bean that you need to have this fully in front of you it's it's the way we do business and we should do business here a motion to table I'll do I'll second it rusty made it okay all in favor table in next right. table thank you thank you Jen and you'll thank Jen you'll you. next week you'll have yeah I'll get it in on the normal deadline right. and you'll have the actual packet with the information that is correct this time I just needed to explain it to you so you didn't think I did nothing from the last time <laughs> Okay, waiver from purchasing policy, policy section 718-15 B and C for two-way radios. Yeah, um, I'm sure if that was actually this conversation occurred before. No, it didn't occur before this board. The conversation occurred uh, in our weekly staff meetings, uh, manager staff meetings on a Tuesday, and that was the discussion of radios and radios department wide. Um, what initiated this whole discussion is when Aquarian wanted to um, have us move our gear off of their water tower prior to um, them getting ready to paint. It caused all of us, meaning police, fire, and public works to start a discussion about, well, whose antenna is it, where should we replace it, can we move it to somewhere else, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was the suggestion of the police chief, which we wholeheartedly agree with, is that we sit down with Lieutenant Tom Goditis, uh, who is their coordinator for radios and communications, to see what they were doing so that we were all on the same page. Um, one of the things that we're trying to achieve out of this is that we all have the same or similar capabilities 
cross frequencies, cross equipment, <coughs> so that in the event of an emergency, um, be it a flood, be it a snow event, be it a whatever, um, they can communicate seamlessly with us and we can communicate seamlessly with them. Uh, certainly, we don't get the same uh, level of radios or communication that the police get. I believe they have something where upwards to 30 channels that they can communicate over. You do. Uh, we're simply, I think, in the three-channel realm. Um, one where would be our normal communications, and then two would be uh, in the event of emergency, they would tell us we'll go to channel X, and we'll talk to you about barricades and evacuation routes and whatever on that. So we did. We sat down with Lieutenant Gaditis. Um, he suggested that he uses uh, two-way communications out of Newington. They um, service and provide all of their radios. Um, and so we did. We reached out to them uh, as their primary provider. Uh, with hopefully that this would be a seamless uh, process. In doing that, we had uh, two-way communications come in and look at our equipment top to bottom. Um, what we discovered um, was that we were we are still operating on an analog system, at least half of our equipment. Yeah, your eyebrows raised. Yeah. So did mine. Um, they're actually going to repair one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven vehicles. They've said we can take the radios out. We can reprogram them so that they can better communicate. A number of them need little things like antennas or power packs of things of that nature. We were operating with Kenwoods in about nine other vehicles, uh, 31, 30, 11, uh, 25 is the van for the emergency pumping equipment, uh, 65, 82, 16. I know they're all numbers just to you, but to us these are, a number of these are frontline um, snow plowing and emergency response uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, for instance, if we have to do evacuations, Unit 14 is our bus, that would be something that we would actually use. It would need this full line communication. So working with two-way communications, we said, well, first they came back and they gave me a contract for replacement radios. And I asked one simple question, digital or analog? Oh, they're analog. Well, <laughs> guys, if we're we're trying to move into this century, uh, please. You know, the whole thing was so that we can communicate seamlessly with these other departments. Um, so they came back, um, and what was a would have been about a ten thousand dollar cost uh, blossomed to the twenty five thousand two hundred and eighty two that you have before you. Um, you know, I could have been. tried to lessen the order to lessen the impact. But as I've told my staff repeatedly, um, management sets the level of safety and then, and then we have to provide that level of safety. And to me, um, communications are, are key or critical to that. To the point that we have a number of, we have several vehicles out there where they can hear us, but they can't respond presently. Um, we have others that they break up halfway through the communications. You get the first word, the seventh word, and the ninth word, and you're supposed to piece together what they said. It's, but it's why fine. do we need the waiver? So, I didn't, thank you, I'm, I'm probably, I was asked uh, by other in team, in uh, upper management, to be very um, clear as to how you got to this point. Don't. Mm, you're clear. Okay, thank you. We've heard it before. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so how we got to this point was um, we did reach out to Motorola. Motorola Solutions nationally provided this quote. This they would end up we would end up purchasing the radios through two-way communications in Newington, but from Motorola Solutions out of Chicago, Illinois. We the reason why we're asking the waivers we're sticking with the. Uh, Jen wrote me down a note. Thank I did you. write you a note. The National, National Association of State Procurement Officials, it's a national bid or a New England bid provided through the states. Um, and it even lists, uh, if we had any questions, talk to Jeffrey Haley at NewHampshire.gov. So this is what uh, state police would use, what fire department would use, police department would use. It's a national bid. And we're asking permission to use that to replace said nine radios for some total of I'll make that motion. That's not a waiver. If it's a state bid, 
We have to be clear on that. Most of the others. So it's in, I'm, I'm going to just clarify because I want everybody to be clear because that's the importance of making sure that we're doing this and we're doing it right. The state of New Hampshire through NASPO, it's a multi-state contract. Doesn't make any difference as long as the state of New Hampshire approved it and within that approval there is a provision for the town to accept the approval. The price yes. is offered in the terms and conditions of the contract will be extended to nonprofit organizations, county, cities, town, school districts, special districts, or precincts and governmental subdivisions in the college. So That's all you need plus an approval from the Board of Selectmen to spend the money under a state contract. So right. there you I go. make that motion. <laughs> I'll you. second it. Discussion? Phil? No sir, thank you. Rick? Regina? So, we will have the you you will have the same as police. Similar quality, not as many bands, but okay. yes. But the same. Similar free, same and similar frequencies and, and. Okay, so you'll be able to communicate with them seamlessly. Correct. Fire. They're going to be. They're still running some analog radios, and they're trying to move into the digital platform too. Okay. But theirs are much more extensive radios than ours. Okay. And it is not a waiver? It is not a waiver because there is a provision within the purchasing policy to use state and federal contracts okay. with the board's permission, okay. provided they have that qualification clause, and she just read it. Okay. <coughs> All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous? Thank you very much. You're not leaving, right? No. Right here. Uh, that's all you had, though, right? Yeah, later on, uh, there's a minor request for okay. speed limit signs on QSAC. But. As you know, you heard public comment probably. Or we maybe did. You didn't. All right. I mean, we have so many sections of town right now, especially down by the beach, that are affected by flooding constantly. Um, somebody made the comment, if we lived there to be fixed, well, I do live on High Street, and it does flood all the time, and it hasn't been fixed. Mm -hmm. So we're suffering the same as you do, and I know Rick, where he lives, it floods. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't make any difference. The fact is, we, and I, I know you don't have any answers right now, but something has to be done to help these people all over town with their drainage pro problems when, I mean, on High Street, you guys know that it also shoots up out of the mm -hmm. waste uh, basin and then back down, yep. and it's doing that in other parts of town. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I think I can give a little synopsis over where there's so many different areas. Um, <clears throat> Because this is a multi-faceted uh, program, that's why a uh, problem, and that's why I asked if John could stay here. Because at the Hampton Area Commission, we have decided to do something um, and monitor the problem I that I have. My problem is that the drains on Ocean Boulevard, which belong to the state, uh, they don't work, and there needs to be some something done there on Ocean Boulevard because it's not the town's. Uh, uh, you know, issue. It's this. It's a state issue. I'm not complaining about from the from the coming from the marsh because that's a whole total different problem, and that's really not so much of the problem that I have. Uh, the although my problem was so bad this week, this and I wanted to say this for these people. I, I said to uh, my assistant, I said, "Go get the camera because today, which would have been, I think, it was last Thursday or Friday." It rained so hard, so fast, uh, that I've never seen the road in front of my place fill up to that to that level. Um, and I came here to talk with Fred today, but you were at the ambulation. Um, and it was scary. And it's pretty, you know, here I am in a hair salon having customers that should be walking in that door. I had six inches of water at my door. And when we went to take the picture, all of a sudden, the next thing you know, all my customers are taking pictures like they think they're at a flood or something. It was unbelievable. And... Uh, so I, when the lady was trying to take a picture out the door, I said, you got to move, the car's coming. And I pushed her out of the way, otherwise she would have got totally wasted. And when the way, when the car went by, I got water inside my building by six feet. So there's a, that came in like a little tsunami because uh, the door was open. So there's one issue. The other issues, like Regina mentioned about uh, is is uh, Manchester one of the roads that didn't have that wasn't fixed 
or, you know, yes. wasn't dealt with yeah. when we did our $12 million infrastructure. There are, I correct. believe, is it five streets or six streets? Oh, there's more than six. Well, at one time we thought there were five or six. Now there appears to be more that haven't been dealt with. So this is an issue that needs to be dealt with. It's, just, it's a can that does not to be kicked down the road. It's not the same issue that I have, but and their issue that they have is very similar to the one that I have because I have gone down there numerous times. I feel bad that t for that lady to think that we haven't responded because a lot of people have gone down there and we've looked at it for ourselves and it's been discussed here. Uh, but I have noticed that a lot the drains don't pick up the water on Ocean Boulevard, so they drain right down there. Well, that one gentleman mentioned about 16th Street, that's standing water. Mm -hmm. That's coming from Ocean Boulevard. It is not coming from the marsh. Now, the marsh thing is another story, mm -hmm. but being on the Hampton Area Commission, which John and I are both on, um, and we are always looking for projects that we can make Hampton better and Hampton Beach, uh, I think we're going to start addressing these things. You people would be more than welcome to come to the meetings. And a lot of things are discussed there about the flood insurance. And I'm not bringing that into this problem here right now about the flood insurance. But there are some recommendations that are being made by different groups, including the University of uh, New Hampshire, that might be beneficial for long-term planning in your neighborhood. So that's something that you might want to do or, you know, pay attention to our uh, agenda. We don't meet during the summertime, but John has made a commitment and I've made a commitment and the whole uh, people on the Hampton Beach Area Commission have been, uh, you know, wanting to look into some of these issues. So get involved at the Hampton Area Commission, not only that here and I think here we're going to need to discuss about, uh, like these people could always get 25 signatures and ask for some type of study to be done, or this board could get behind a, uh, a warrant article to bring these issues forward with the help of uh, Chris and Jennifer and even John or whatever, uh, we could all give some input on this. So it's something that we could, this is a big problem and it has many different facets. And I think in the, long, in the end, we're going to have to uh, do one thing at a time or we're gonna definitely have to work together because the state's involved here as is the town has some issues and they have the issue, the town has the issue of help, trying to keep uh, it in a healthy state down there. Kevin is the, uh, uh, Schultz is the health, what, what is he? Health officer. Health officer. I'm not sure where that fits into this either. So I would like to hear from Chris or Jennifer what they think about doing a study. One of the things that was mentioned about here about the river, uh, everyone that lives on the marsh, and I think you know this, Rusty, are quite aware that in the old days, those different mar uh, channels in the marsh and that they were dredged. The farmers used to just go out there and do it and the, it worked very well. So is do we need a study to see if dredging has to be done or can dredging ever be done? Do we have to get permission or where do we go from here? Um, I would agree with you 100% on the study and, there, and 100% and, um, I'm amazed you're, you're, you're very versed on this. And oh, I've been living it for more, t it's actually, it's ironic because it's gotten much worse for me for 10 years. Okay. And that's why I think it's, an, my issue isn't the marsh. I think a lot of it has to do with this, the drainage on Ocean Boulevard. We, we looked at this whole packet as information that I pulled together today in anticipation of being asked something tonight. Um, yes, um, I'm with you 100%, a Warren article to commence with a study. Uh, I'm not normally a fan of studies that tell me that I have flooding. But in this particular case, uh, you, you are correct and there is multifaceted. The other thing is I'm very concerned um, that if we were to take abrupt action, that we would do something that would be detrimental to Meadow Pond into that environment. In particular, one of the things I'm concerned with is um, changing the hy hydrology in a major way that would allow the expansion of 
uh, Phragmites to grow over the rest of Meadow Pond or the marsh. So, um, yes, uh, dredging is one of those things, but to be honest with you, my quick numbers were that there's $11 million gone. Um, and without knowing what that would actually accomplish, I, I'm re resonant about recommending that as a just go out and do it. Um, when I got here June 1, 2011, um, Fred put me, took me in his car, and it was one of the first places he took me to was Kings Highway and said, you have a problem down here. And we went down and saw Kings Highway, Green Street, Gation Street. Within six months, I had developed a plan um, and a cost estimate, 160, sorry, 1680000 uh, Yes, yeah, sorry, $1,683,460, 48 catch basins, 6,000 feet of pipe. Uh, we focused in on reusing the sewer pump station down there to collect this water right off of Kings Highway and those neighborhoods and pump it literally um, partially in a, a former sewer main that's still there down to the high, uh, sorry, Winnicott Road Bridge and deposit it on that southern side of the bridge, actually getting it out of the the uh, metal pond. Uh, that would be something that we could control. You could actually set floats and turn on and turn off. Um, but that that's one possible solution. But I think the first thing that needs to be happened, because it is a sensitive environment, is a drainage study. Far more than what I could do. And just so everybody's clear, if we were talking about a study, because people are concerned now about their flooding. Right. What time frames would we be talking about in order to do that, and what time frames would we be talking about for action to be taken? I mean, so just so that people know exactly where we're at. It, I would recommend an RFQ uh, that we propose out there, interview um, selected qualified firms, um, get from them a, a scope of services, formulate it as a warrant article, have it approved in March. In the short term, I would recommend that we go out and do some pumping, some jetting, some try to clear out some of the um, the outfalls. I've asked, uh, I've directed Toby Spain Howard to look at it. He went over today. It was it was severely underwater. Um, I, we do have a tide gate there, but it's bypassing the tide gate. It's literally coming up through the soil. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, last year we did propose through the Warren article process. Let's start with King's Highway. And I understand, and that's not to lay blame. We have so many things on the cards on the table. We picked what we thought were the most important ones. I uh, think this is rising to the top. It is rising to the top. There's one other thing I wanted to mention. Down, and I've mentioned that here before, no one knows what I'm talking about, uh, although I hear, have it, heard it mentioned several times recently by other people, is that over in Salisbury, they have put a wall up for five streets. I don't know why it's those five streets, but maybe that's the type of thing that would help down in Manchester. I don't know how they even did it. Army Corps of Engineers. Yeah, but something major happened there, and I don't think anyone in our town government knows exactly why it happened, uh, you know, how that happened. And I think we, that we, should and see what's we need to investigate that. The them. other thing is I want to do say that when that flood was there this week, uh, DOT is there. They know they're trying to do whatever they can uh, because yeah. they were there trying to clear the drains uh, within 15 minutes of when it started. So they are paying attention. They know they have a problem, and that's why we have to work at it. Mm -hmm. Our first letters that are in the file go all the way back to 1990. Mm -hmm. So it's 27 years we've we've known it, and uh, I've only been here six, but it was one of the key things that. Mr. Welch. In the end, life. people may have to modify their homes down there. But a, but a couple of things, just so that people know, that you're going to try some... Well, we have a, we have a procurement and purchasing policy and, a, and a, a process to raise money, and we have to work within that policy. But right. I think there's some act, active things we can do now, now, but some things that we methodically have to put in the, in the process. And to get, the, to get to the main issue, it would take a warrant article... I think we're looking at a fairly significant 
appropriation of money, at least 100000 to study it to then say this is just like what we were talking about earlier with electrical lines is what are our options. They would okay. lay those out just like we did with Bicentennial Seawall, all these types of these sensitive projects. You don't want to go at them um, willy-nilly or in an unorganized fashion because you could literally wreak havoc. I mean, I've thought of going to 580 Winnicott kind of Road and put my backhoe out there and doing a, a dredge, get me in jail, but um, it would lower Meadow Pond, but it, it could have some detrimental effects to wildlife, plant growth, everything. Okay. High Street, uh, we went down there and looked at that. We've, we're going to have to come back and recommend to you an actual removal of Phragmites behind those properties on the north side because the water's not being allowed to run towards the mill due to the Phragmites growth. So that's another one of those facets. That particular yeah. area is being <coughs> impacted by that's that. That's part of my problem, too, with those Phragmites. Well, I just want to make sure that we're yeah. clear and that people no, that's, hear you exactly what we're table. saying. Right. You know, yeah. so that yeah. so that they're clear too <coughs> on what our actions are going to be. Other people. And the only thing I, I can say is this: this spring has been wetter than the past right. previous. Last three year we were in a drought. This Last year, year we, we had a not. severe drought. Right. Water's going to seek its own level. Right. And so, if the water in the street is the same level as the pond, mm -hmm. it has no option but to seek its own level. Yeah, I mean, and it can't go out through the drains if the pond is full. We were there uh, three, four weeks ago, Jim and I, Jim Hafey and I, and uh, Mrs. Sorensen came out and she said, I don't know what you did in the last four hours. The water went down six inches. What did you do? Tide went out. Uh, it was about the same day that I saw Rusty and he wanted to know what I was doing about the flooding and I showed him my initial prayer and then deep in thought and no, it's, it's we're not we're not ignoring it we're very much right. aware of what's going on but as, as far it, as the drains are concerned down there they have the same problem that Rick has yeah. okay the drain that's in front of your yard on the state highway uh, as you know the town tried to clear that because it was getting to be such a nuisance and the state couldn't do it we had the equipment we couldn't do it either the drains that are in this area are impacted the same way by all the growth out there in the pond, plus the raise, the, the rise of the sediment, right. so the water can't get out. Toby's in fact, determined it works today in the excavation we did two years ago is now all grown back in. Sure, absolutely. It's, it's it maybe even been worse than it was when we first yeah. tackled it two years. I ago. I looked at it on Google Earth this this afternoon, and it is worse than it was two years ago. Right. Maybe we can advise the people to pay attention to the uh, agendas, and it does help if you come, uh, particularly when we're going to be talking about it. Uh, and, you know, it's when we start working on the Warren articles, when is that? September? Yeah. Kind of. Right. And in September, the Hampton Area Commission also uh, will um, be meeting again. And I'd just like to ask Mr. Nyan if this is something that these people might want to ask to be on his agenda. And we'd like to throw out there, uh, we've, we've come to, under Jen's guidance, we've come to realize that, uh, you know, uh, frequent informational emails, like for instance, when we were doing High and Lafayette and this Lafayette Road water project, um, we could literally put together a sub list of people on this this particular problem. Uh, if if ever, those people want to give us their emails, we'll just we'll literally give them updates. They wouldn't have to say, "Geez, I missed Channel 22." We'd give them the updates, and we could get to the people down at the other end of the beach because they're planning on coming in here. They are planning mass. on coming in, what? and I think they're going to be planning. Bring in some stuff that we might want to look and at. And that might be, you might, people want to come for that, too. It yeah, pays see. to be here. They haven't officially sent the request in. That's right. Well, you have to check, check the But hopefully agenda. the next meeting or so. Yeah. So I, say, and I wanted to ask about John. Is this something that they would be able to come and be on the agenda? Sure. And we'd be very willing to work with the town on any uh, issue like this, whether or not it's uh, on the beach or even outside, outside of the beach. Okay, great, because that's a good way to do it. One other question on High Street pavement. Mm -hmm. Our contractor just informed us what last Tuesday, end of last week, um, 
He's looking after Fourth of July weekend. After Fourth so of July weekend. That tenth, We're the looking tenth. for a low tide cycle mid June. Okay. And that's Starting all July for to... working on that drainage. It's yep. not just because of them. We yep. had to wait to low tide and then low mid. -tide. But that's the reason because people say to me why, and I right. have explained yes. that to them that it's because they they have to wait for the tide. To go work on that catch. to work that to make it totally work. figured out if you put we put an 18 inch balloon or bag if you will in the outlet we can effectively dewater that area so that we can work so it'll be you know our emergency pump 4,000 gallons a minute that bag we can we'll, we'll have about a six couple of days we'll have a so six to eight hour working period to get that stuff done the 10th through the 14th Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Maybe for uh, the yes, opportunity to speak. Yeah. No, I'm going to go meet you. Well, just a minute, please, Mr. Oh, Chairman. Yeah. I, I didn't get a chance to uh, weigh sorry. in on this. I wasn't asked, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I want to I say that uh, um, water is an issue in this town, and it, it's, an in, it's an issue globally, and it's an issue in this country. Right across the street, uh, my family has property that has been inundated through development that is now flooded, and uh, forget getting to the driveway. We can't use it. And it's acres and acres of valuable property. And there's an abutter to our left and an abutter to our right. And people just uh, 200 meters, 300 meters to the uh, west um, enjoy prolific economic advantage with their property, and we're denied that. So uh, when I go down to uh, property today and I see taxpayers that are standing knee-deep in water, I can surely empathize with them. And if that property, um, much like our property, uh, has been uh, the victim, and this is to the property, not to any family, but that property has been uh, taken from folks by planning board decisions, by zoning board decisions, by infrastructure, then the town is complicit in, in solving and finding a remedy for that. And I want to say that uh, our, our formal lines of communication on this issue, and I've been queried by uh, a half dozen people, and we send the email spreads out for a week, and we say we're going to be back, and then we're right on it. Got a phone call today. You go down there. I, w I want to see me personally a much more formal, direct line of communication with some representative, one person that speaks for your group down at Gentian, down at that area, uh, that that meets as early as this week with. Uh, the leadership uh, and perhaps the assistant town manager or town manager this week so you're satisfied that as taxpayers and there's 15 or 20 people right now down there that I saw today that are underwater and yep. it's unhealthy it's a health hazard it's a danger to children it's a danger to cars it's a danger to their way of life and it's unacceptable in this town and it's been approved by the planning board it's right. been approved by town blah 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 and it, it's a standard that is not going to exist under this board's watch and i would implore uh the director that's why he makes the big bucks to get with uh, somebody from gentian and uh, set up something this week and they can meet on their own and and they can develop those those uh uh, schemes of maneuver in those communication efforts to be vigorous about uh, immediate uh, remediation of any troubles they have, notwithstanding the forces of nature. But to get right on that uh, as early as tonight, make communication, meet with these folks, go down there and meet them at a house or meet them up here or in the manager's office upstairs uh, for immediate remediation this year and alert them to the uh, uh, government process about warrant articles. I don't think it should be for them to put in uh, 25 signatures and do that work. I think we as uh, elected leaders, and Mr. Welch has already done this, but until you go down there and look at, at that, those, those people standing in knee-deep water, you don't understand the urgency of it. Um, that, that we lead and uh, drive those warrant articles and to expand <coughs> that, uh, um, that effort to look at civil engineering, to look at liaison with the state, to look at DES, to look at all those issues. And I, I'd be interested that the board is informed as early as tomorrow morning about what the director's uh, efforts is with this outreach to these folks because uh, 12 different people talking to five different selectmen to people that are on vacations to people that have family challenges um, uh, creates a lot of dissatisfaction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would just like to say that the uh, all of these boards, and I've been on all of them, the planning board, the uh, uh, zoning board, when I was elected to the zoning board and approved the condos down the street from me, I didn't realize every time it rained, I would have all the wood chips from that condo in my yard. Mm -hmm. And they uh, did all these approvals with the idea that these drains work, and they don't. Mm -hmm. Just from Winnicunit Road, 
to Boar's Head, there are 11 drains that do not work. The ones that are down below that, that's the ones that state use, they push the water right into the ocean. And these are the part of the solutions. We've got to figure out how that's going to happen in our areas. Flash problem is the same thing. It's from development. You guys go down Manchester Ave, you look to the left on Keefe, it's raised up, it's filled in, there's a drain. It's accentuating the problem on Manchester Ave. Yeah. All right? So something needs to be done, and the town needs to work together, all the boards, to figure it out. Thank you. Very quickly, just... Yeah, just quickly. I understand there has to be some study, and I appreciate your concerns, but I would like to know what could be done this summer. You know, we don't want to go through another summer of this nightmare. Well, that, that's what Phil was just talking about. Right. I think that, that there would be some kind of response formulated tomorrow and get back to all the folks that are, that are affected by this, not just your neighborhood, but other neighborhoods, on what can be done, what can't be done. Short-term solution would be much appreciated. Well, is that is that Fred? We'll is that what you We'll bring right. down the equipment we have. We've got pumps. Um, we'll see what we can accomplish. But it's a long-term problem, so it has it to be is. dealt with. I agree, but I would like to see some relief at least yep, yep. for this summer. Right. Just go ahead and violate the statute. Quote him on that. All right. So. <laughs> Emergencies are emergencies. Right. Town manager's report. Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, the water main replacement continues on Lafayette Road during the nighttime. Uh, please be observant of the detours and workers and their equipment on the roadway. Their operations are, of course, very dangerous by their nature. The State Department of Transportation continues working on Route 1 from Campton to Seabrook. Uh, and traffic continues to snake through the detours. It's a very interesting problem to watch. Work continues uh, on completing paving operations on various town roads, including backup for new pavement and final driveway uh, and, and roadway joining operations. Drakeside Road is scheduled to be closed starting July 5th for the purpose of removing the railroad abutments and reconstruction of the highway. Closure will be for an extended period of time to complete the required work. My understanding is that Public Works has uh, rented several uh, electronic boards to advise people of the closure. And it's going to be probably for a period of roughly 30 days. Mr. Chairman, just, just for your information, you have a number of vacancies that currently exist on boards and commissions that you appoint. You have two vacancies on the Lease Land Commission. You have one vacancy on the Mosquito Control Commission. You have one vacancy on the Recreation and Advisory Committee. And that's it. Everything else is full, which is good because it's quite a long list. <laughs> um, we've had a request from the precinct uh, to put a nighttime drop, drop box, or actually it's a small safe, uh, to be put into the beach fire station. They have to deposit their money they collect from uh, the parking lot someplace that's secure, uh, and we'd like you to get to get. We'd like to get permission from you to do that, um, so that they can they can in fact put that piece of equipment in there. It has been suggested to us by our insurance people that we should have an agreement uh, that the town is not responsible for loss, damage, theft uh, <coughs> by placing uh, th this in our facility and it's placed there at the precinct's own risk. That the town has no access to the box, uh, that uh, uh, we're not liable for any uh, any liabilities uh, that may occur, uh, not in the town's care, custody, or control, uh, just allowing the placement uh, of the drop box on town property as a security matter. And we advise them, of course, to get their own insurance for possible theft or anything like that. So with those caveats, I don't have a problem placing it there. Uh, and we can make some sort of formal agreement to come back to the board, if that's all right with you folks. Uh, they, they do need some assistance, I know that. Uh, we talked tonight about um, flooding. We've also had uh, reports and complaints from Glade Path, as well as Manchester Street. Uh, the tide gate on Green Street uh, was being inspected again today to see whether or not it's any help, and we believe it is not, simply because the water, in fact, is over the gate, which doesn't help at all. 
Um, we we continue. We'll continue to have beach flooding for a while. That's just the nature of the beast. Uh, crosswalk on Route One A, which the board had requested, uh, we asked the state to paint. Uh, this is down uh, near Dumas Avenue. Uh, this I have communicated with the state. The state has uh, D Division One or District Excuse me, District Six has sent a, a request onto Concord. Uh, to have that reviewed, and if Concord approves, the walk will be installed. Um, that's Manchester Street again. Beach flooding again. And let's see. That's about it, sir. Okay, questions? I have a question. You just reminded me. The two sidewalk lights that we get they're already out by the galley hatch and there's one down by uh to go down by um yeah on route one yeah like yes. that yeah yeah from fast and the other one's right. out here how much do one of those costs about six thousand dollars yeah because there would be some residents <laughs> and probably business owners that might be interested they would even offer to pay for all mm -hmm. of it or most of it right. to put one down at the uh, crosswalk on ashworth and um l street Mm -hmm. We have to order them. Between six and sixty-five hundred dollars. Would that be something that we can agree okay. to? The board approves it. That's not a problem. I've uh, talked to some concerned citizens. I don't want to see anyone get hit there anymore. Right. Yeah. It's a dangerous location. It is. Yep. No question about it. Rusty. Uh, a couple of things. Drake. <coughs> Just to those people who live on Drake Side Road. I mean, uh, we, Public Works is done due diligence and trying to fill those holes. I mean, the area is just wet, and so anytime it gets wet, and the wet season we've had, it, the pavement breaks up. But they're, they're down there probably two or three times a week filling those holes, so it's good to see that this is getting done. The road will be closed, but that's okay. Do you need a motion for the fire station for the precinct? I think it would be a good idea. Yeah. I'll, make, I'll make a motion we allow the precinct with the caveat of what the town manager said to allow them to put a lockable box at the beach station. Second. That was second. Discussion? No? All in favor? Good. Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, Rick, questions? Town manager? Now, so, could you just mention about the box again? The is. Did something happen down there? No, they, they would like some secure location at night where they can deposit the receipts from their uh, the parking lots that oh, they control. Okay. And this would help them do that because it'll be a safe. I was, I was just curious, uh, who locks up the uh, that office up there? I mean, you know, the, the, the precinct room there? It's it's controlled by the fire department, and and that door stays locked except when the precinct is using it. Yeah. So you, they. So it, it just automatically locks. Well, it's it's set to. Uh, it's, it's like our front door. You can either unlock it and leave it unlocked, or you can lock it permanently. Because one time I was there, and it hit me after I got home. I was the last one to leave, and I never thought about locking it. Yeah. The the firefighters always check, check. it at night. The outside yeah. door is locked. Right. Okay. They're very good about that. Bill? Oh, no, sir. Thank you. Okay, I have a question. Sir, and I've had a lot of complaints on the first thing you talked about. Lafayette Road, nighttime work, residents. Yep. Now, we've got to do one of two things. Either say there's something that can be done or there's nothing that can be done because people just don't want to be calling up and asking somebody and then they tell them to go to somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. So, I mean, if, if there's nothing that can be done, there's nothing that can be done, but I want to let people know that, or if oh, there is something... Right. Or if, I understand. They can, if they can contact somebody, I want to, you know, but get a def definitive answer. Okay. I understand the problem. And, yeah. and the definitive answer is there really isn't anything that can be done. When, when the board granted permission to Aquarian to do the work at night, they tailored their contracts and bids to allow that to happen. So they would have to change all of those and probably go back to uh, some sort of a premium arrangement with a contractor. Okay, so so it would, it's out of our control. So the fact is, it's going to continue. It's, and hopefully it gets done as soon as possible. Right. And, and, and so they, they should try to mitigate it themselves with whatever they can do in their house? Yeah, it's an aggravating situation if the noise bothers you, and it's from 10 o'clock at night till 6 o'clock in the morning, which is sleep time. 
Yeah. Okay, I just want to be... And I, and I want to be very, very clear, clear that when we do the sewer out there, it's probably going to be something of the same nature. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. That's all hey, I had. Chris, you're going to be here? Yeah, about two seconds. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. All right, old business. Is that what we're on now? I think so. Okay, purchasing policy and procedures. This has been extremely confusing. We've had a lot of emails about it and stuff, and a lot of there was there was confusion on the website. There was confusion of what it was, and also we voted. We took a vote to our vote was to not to approve a new purchasing policy, but to. Actually, to reinforce what we had done. Right. Yeah, that's what about I, it. Let's do this right now. Let's clear it up, make sure it's absolutely clear, it's absolutely precise. And the fact is that no bids over, nothing over $15,000 has been signed off without coming before. No, we're very fastidious about that. Okay. It, it, it is, and I think maybe some, where some of the confusion is, is that proper bids that are received within the policy that are in excess of 15000 but less than 50000 don't come to the board. They're just awarded, provided they meet all the requirements of the policy. It's when something doesn't meet the requirements of the policy, it has to come to the board, or if there's a question about the bid, it has to come to the board. So that's, I think, where the $50,000 figure comes from, that that's the maximum ceiling that I can sign a contract for if it complies with everything in the ordinance. The way it's always been. That's the way it's always been. It's always that been. That has not been a change. That's never been changed. All right. Okay. I did propose some changes to this particular provision, which is is in red in your in your your policy here. Um, the process uh, for purchases that equal or exceed fifteen thousand dollars. I tried to put something into effect that people would understand on the operational end of things so that we would stop having some problems in those areas. And so I palabered on, actually, in, 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 in putting this together. Um, there are clarifications in here about what you have to do. Um, purchases that fall in this category are required to be either bid or a, uh, or a proposal under the purchasing policy of the town. And bids and proposals are different things because they deal sometimes with federal contracts and, and state requirements. Um, the following is a clarification of the process to be used in accomplishing that task. This clarification is mandatory unless waived by vote of the Board of Selectmen. Items ex uh, excluded from this clarification. Items that are purchased via state or federal bids and single source purchases expenditures for legal matters and matters dealing with requests for qualifications are excluded from this policy clarification, as are any items waived by vote of the Board of Selectmen, or items that are specifically voted under a town meeting warrant article that directs that a specific vendor be used for a specific purchase. Those using state and federal bids for purchases in lieu of bidding must attach a copy of the portion of the entire state and federal document that specifically authorizes a town to participate in the state or federal bid. These documents must accompany your purchase requisition for the board approval of the purchase. Uh, in the case of the sole source supplier, you must document the sole source in writing so as to demonstrate your inability to obtain the items from any other supplier. The process to be followed by departments. Departments, boards, committees, and commissions wishing to purchase goods, materials, equipment, or other items, the estimated cost of which is $15,000 or more, and which requires a bidder proposal shall contact the administrative assistant as re, uh, for required formats prior to preparing written documents that conform with the purchasing policy. Once draft bids for proposals have been completed, they are to be forwarded both electronically and in non-PDF format and in hard copy to the administrative assistant in the town manager's office. Accompanying the draft documents will be a list of 10 prospective bidders, if possible, prepared uh, by the bidding entity together with the address, mailing envelopes, and other prospective bidders. Draft bids or proposals received will be reviewed for compliance with the purchasing policy and then referred to town council for legal review. 
Upon completion of the final review, the administrative assistant will mail the bids or proposals to the designated prospective bidders and forward the PDF copy to the bidding entity. The document will not be changed at this stage without permission in writing from the administrative assistant and town council. Once mailed, the bids or proposals will be added to the town's website for public viewing and other for and other prospective bidders. That's what we added to the policy, okay. nothing else. And we did not change anything else. We did not change anything else, but I am going to make a suggestion to the board. We talked about this today in, in staff. Uh, that in fact we provide within the policy a definition of what a waiver is okay. because that's not there okay. and with your permission we're going to draft that we're going to bring that to the next meeting we ask that you adopt this and at the next meeting we're going to put in a requirement to define what a waiver is and how it operates okay and we will vote on it at the next, at the next meeting on the waiver questions I have no questions Rusty no questions Mr. Bean negative sir Mr. good all right, then we're going to be totally clear on this, and that's good. This is it. This is the end of it. We're never going to talk about it again, I hope. So <laughs> we're going to vote on this, this tonight, or are we waiting for the... My suggestion is you go ahead and vote on this tonight. We'll amend it next next meeting with the waiver policy to be included within the document. I'll make the motion, that, that motion. I'll second it. <clears throat> All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh... New Hampshire cost sharing ambulance coverage. Who is going to speak? I ask this be put on the agenda. I'm going to make some brief comments, and then I'm going to defer to uh, uh, town council appropriately, who is going to uh, spearhead uh, the effort at the board's discretion. Uh, it's tax time uh, in in Hampton, and we're going in to pay our taxes this month. And um, we, uh, we, we handle a series of uh, challenges in this town. Uh, this past fall, we had uh, Stratum come in. Stratum uh, is uh, the third richest community in the state of New Hampshire in uh, household income. And uh, we support a water f infrastructure. We support uh, the operation of that. Uh, they rail up at the uh, Public Utilities Commission, knock on doors, and they're granted uh, access to what us hardworking. Uh, individuals that aren't the third uh, highest in the state in terms of household income. The meals and rooms uh, tax came out, uh, the, the allocation to that, there's a slight uptick in that. Uh, Self-government is a competition of ideas, uh, respectfully, and a competition for revenue. Uh, the meals and rooms uh, came out. Um, Bedford, which has a household income of 125000 uh, and is dwarfed by our contributions to the state in this terms of tolls and our whole our whole 200 million that goes up there to the state. Uh, in a two-year uh, biennium, they're going to receive $2.2 .2 million, which far exceeds what we're going to get. Um, Gosstown, the same way. They're going to get $1.8 million. Um, in Hampton, for everything we do, we're going to get $1.5 million back. Uh, so it goes on and on and on and on and on. And then you look at our contributions which is uh, what our, that, that small preface was into, the competition for revenue, the appropriate allocation of reimbursement for ser uh, services. Mr. Welch had sent up a follow-on to Commissioner Rose regarding our fire assets and what's going on down there. Mark will lead us forward and the way forward on that. But again, it's tax time when we go in and pay our taxes. And the 1933 uh, uh, document, which is essentially the deed or the purchase and sale agreement, uh, talks about specific responsibilities that we have. Commissioner Rose did call me back uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, I sent an email to Mr. Welch uh, and to Mr. Waddell and the town esquire to put this on the agenda tonight. I asked the commissioner if he had a response to the letter. He stated to me on the phone that he did not have a response. I asked him if he had an opinion on our letter and the concept of behind the, the letter, and he said he had no opinion on that. I asked him if he had a timeline to make those decisions uh, about the uh, concept of the letter that Mr. Welch drafted per the order of the selectmen. And uh, he said he did not. Uh, that's excessive uh, government uh, bureaucracy. And these aren't elected officials. These are people that come up uh, through different pipelines around the flagpole. And uh, here's a man that's got a letter to, uh, from a, a, uh, a town that pays $200 million a year into their coffers to different, different platforms, but $200 million nonetheless. And uh, we're informed by the commissioner uh, that there's no response. 
that he has no opinion and he's got no timeline. The implicit taskings, of course, would be for him to send that to legal, to uh, have his, uh, uh, ta his counsel get with our counsel to engage with Mr. Welch. We get nothing. Zero. Nada. And that is not uh, uh, atypical. And we see that in concrete. Many on this board have served up there. And uh, we heard tonight about people that are uh, imbued with challenges, many of them that uh, stem from the state. So as we go in uh, to pay our taxes um, this July, uh, and many of us will, we're getting uh, uh, smoked on the meals and rooms distribution. We're getting smoked on uh, revenue distribution. And uh, we're being ignored uh, by people that make a lot of money up in Congress and never come down here. And, uh, um, there are operational standards that, that exist on the beach that we addressed previously. But uh, um, in terms of an opinion on the legality of this, Mark's going to lead us to the way forward. The 1933 document is the document. And as you look at that, we need an interpretation on our fire assets to include um, retirement costs, uh, health insurance costs, depreciation of our capital infrastructure and uh, de depreciation of our, our fire assets uh, to include those brand new uh, um, fire stations that we built, which is why it was so important for the Gatsby to be identified. And our depreciation expense is about 10% of our operating budget every single year. And that, of course, uh, the state with their portion uh, gets for free. And Mr. Chairman, I yield to the town attorney. Thank you. The board at its meeting on June 5 uh, voted 5 to nothing to uh, send uh, correspondence through the manager to the Commissioner of Dread uh, regarding uh, cost sharing for the ambulance service. And uh, by the way, that is not addressed as in the 1933 session law as an obligation that the town is to assume with regard to the operations of the state park. There are some things that are addressed in the 1933 session law, such as maintaining public order. Ambulance uh, and uh, service is not addressed in that. Nevertheless, this is a, a um, critical to a healthy functioning of the state park, which the state derives a great deal of revenue from. And uh, it's important that uh, for the safety of the users of the state park that the ambulance service be equipped in such a way both with uh, ambulance and personnel to run it to be located at the beach fire station nevertheless there is not uh, the funding in-house on our part to do that and so uh, the fire department developed uh, two additional personnel the cost of what that would include in, in, including all benefits uh, to staff an ambulance at the beach fire station to allow for quicker response time. And this was the cost that was passed along in the manager's letter of June 6, 2017 and June 21, 2017, to which no response has been received. Uh, my first recommendation is that a, a deadline be given to the Dread Commissioner for a response to these letters so that it won't just be hanging out there. I would recommend that uh, August 1 be used as the deadline to be given. Um, now, with regard to the other aspect of this, I would recommend to the board, having examined this, that there's one an aspect of this that has not been addressed before. It will require some uh, staff checking on this, but in the past, we have received ambulance calls from state employees, the lifeguards, namely on the beach, to which we have responded, and it is believed that a significant number of those ambulance calls although billed to the patients, have not been paid, leaving them unpaid. It is, uh, these are people who were using the state park. The state park personnel called and said, come and get them. And uh, we believe that their fair share of that uh, bill should be paid, in fact, by the, uh, by the caller, <coughs> namely the state. But we need to uh, examine the metrics on that to develop what the cost on that was, which may, in fact, uh, for unpaid bills already incurred for service um, exceed what's being called for in, in uh, Manager Welsh's letter. But I would like the board's permission to uh, dedicate some staff time to developing that. I'll make that motion. A second. All in favor? 
Thank you. I would also like to ask, um, what, um, if this is not addressed in the 1933 agreement, there are other things that are not addressed in the 1933 agreement. Why can't we do a side uh, agreement for the things that aren't in there? We could, we could, in well, fact, I think that's that. what we need to investigate. And that is, in fact, I believe, the thrust of the manager's letter, seeking for them to pay. <laughs> that was that was the uh, the intent to to reach an agreement on that very point. I would say it, he's saying other points in addition to that. Yeah, other points, and it, it, <clears throat> maybe this is the time that we need to go to court about this. This is something I think is valuable. Mm -hmm. And we've kicked the can down the road since 1933. And it's time, if we have to go to court, we need to go to court. Basically, we've run out of road. It's been too long, too far. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's just too long. And something needs to be done. This is another one of those problems. We just need to do it. We don't get any response. And I was a believer that it could be different, but I have not seen it change. I think it's gotten worse, actually. Yeah, it has gotten worse. Yes. That's you know, I think there's a big and problem. I think that we should be making a demand that whoever is down there, like we have people that are in charge here that live three and four hours away. They should live around here. Speaking about department heads and stuff like that, living uh, in the town, I mean, these people should be responsible. Now we have another person that just retired from there. He was, it's only been two years. Now he's gone. He's given up his job during the middle of the summer when they need him most. Right. And, you know, we just, it, it's, it's really unbelievable what's happening. I have been contacted, and I'm not going to mention who it is, but it's somebody that works down there, said that the bathrooms are absolutely filthy. And there's one person, from what I understand, an older guy, a senior citizen, that is um, doing all, I was told, cleaning all the bathrooms, and he can't keep up with it. And there's all these kids that they finally have hired, so they didn't have them at the beginning, and all they do is stay on their phone. They're not interested in cleaning bathrooms, from what I've been told. So there's some issues here. And they've spent all that money, and if the bathrooms are going to be uh, in a bad condition, it's not going to. It's going to be a waste of money. They need to keep up what they've done. Mr. Chairman, if I may, and uh, Town Square, uh, uh, New Hampshire Public Radio was uh, speaking with uh, Rainy Cushing and myself in Concord. Uh, the the uh, assertion by uh, Mr. Cushing was the seawall, and that that is alluded to in the 1933 agreement, comes on the, the, the highway department and should not be taken into consideration as some aid to Hampton without that seawall. And read the 1933 document. That is a responsibility of the state, mutually exclusive, and part of the consideration, if you will, for that agreement and us giving up that state park. We had uh, uh, sponsored legislation, House Bill 302, for, to simply study the, main, the, the, the leasing of the park. Uh, it was stepped on uh, seriously in committee and gained no headway. And this is what I'm talking about, excessive government. Director Bryce, who formerly is, I guess, a requisite to his job running a hospitality venue, was in charge of trees for the state of New Hampshire. And it was the Division of Forest, uh, a far cry from the operational requisites and exigencies that are required here in the state park. The question was, um, well, how, how could Hampton, uh, you know, lease the state park? Well, you remove that, that seawall consideration. And then my response was simply, well, we police the beach. We take the trash from the beach. We take the sewage from the beach. We respond to the fire down the beach. Our infrastructure contributions to the beach have exceeded the states. And they take all the money. So to me, it sounds like there's a, a heck of a lot of room for improvement. Uh, Mr. Cushing's response, and he, he was one that, that, that spearheaded that uh, the state uh, uh, should assume the responsibility for the seawalls under the highway budget and take it away from the, uh, um, the, the notion that it's associated with the beach. But his, his notion supports Rick's is we have a town attorney for this, this type of issue use, and, and he, of course, carries a lot of weight in Concord and is one of the finest legislators up there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anything else? Okay, moving on to... I have other old business. Okay. Um, 
I have, uh, and this is where Chris uh, and Jennifer, um, the I've had numerous complaints with people about the wall up there, and I try to explain the position, and I, one person that called me this week and was quite upset uh, is he uh, lives in that area and he likes to come over there and he has a handicapped child uh, that they go and they they've been wanting to park in that the handicapped spaces that are there now I did go there yesterday to make sure because I know I was going to mention it tonight and the spaces were clear but he said that the spaces have been filled with, I thought he mentioned like sand or debris or anything like that. Have those uh, handicapped spaces, any of them been Not to my knowledge, unavailable? I looked at it was three weeks ago. So. Yeah. Well, when I went there yesterday, there were two of them. Are there any more than two? I don't believe so. No. So, there, and you know, I try to explain to people that what's there seems like it's necessary, and a lot of people are unhappy with the rocks and the this and the that. But I've been telling them to call you, so uh, that's one of the issues that I wanted to bring up. Then the other thing, I talked to um, Jamie Sullivan today and mentioned it. There's numerous people complaining, again, on the numbered streets uh, where, you know, people are just not happy. There's a woman that lives on, it could be 5th Street, but I think it's 6th Street, uh, and I have her name if we need it, um, that her mail doesn't get delivered most of the time or, you know, many times through the year, including during the winter and sometimes during the summer, uh, I guess more often during the summer because so many cars are parking and the, the mail will not, the Hampton uh, Post Office will not deliver to her. And she's very concerned about that. She's one of the ones that are, she says that her street is one of the thinnest streets, and in her opinion, it shouldn't have parking on either side, which is something that um, Jamie seemed to be aware of. Uh, and then there, there was another case uh, where the police have been called this week, and I understand there were as many as three police cars down there, and a confrontation between the neighbors, and I mentioned uh, some of the issue the, to Jamie, and he's going to look into it to see whatever. But there's a lot of issues down there. There's a lot of people that are unhappy, and I'm not sure what we can do, but I do think it's something that we need to pay attention to. No, if we receive the complaints, we'll look into each one of them. And I keep telling the people they have to complain. Okay. Everyone wants me to complain. Call us. Call us. We'll look. <laughs> I know. And I know that the lady that doesn't get her mail, she's a, a mild, meek type person, and she hates to complain. It's painful to her, and she hasn't complained, and this has gone on for a long time for her. That simply advises what the problem is, and we'll try to fix it for her. I asked her that if she would bring down the um, information that she gets from the post office about yeah. not delivering her mail, that yeah. might start, you know. We'll check with the post office see how that works so I think this is something that this is the time of the year when we have more of an issue with this and yeah. I'm not really sure what we can do okay, if the mailboxes are on one side of the street and parking has been designated for that side we can always move the parking to the other side yeah. I mean I think that there is a uh, issue there are other issues I mean is this the time that we want to investigate whether these there should be parking meters some of these people have said to me that if there were parking meters down there and the town had their own meters down there they would be glad to lease them just to keep the people you know keep spaces available for themselves they would pay whatever it is that those, those meters it's, it would be an additional source of revenue that would decrease taxes but that's a sizable uh, thing for the town to undertake. It's now, going to require some research. I, tr tr trust me, I understand that. I understand the other end of the beach, but I'm just throwing it out there. I've heard other people discussing it. You know, maybe that's something that can be brought up. Yeah, can and be. it wouldn't be just in that area. No, you'd have to, you'd have to consider all impacts everywhere. Mm -hmm. So some public hearings or whatever, so I'm just throwing that out there for the future. Rick, if somebody's got a uh, handicapped sticker or Placard. They can park at any state 
spot. They don't have to have a handicap spot. Yeah, I said that. I was looking at the handicap spots. They are right next to the ocean. But they, uh, but they, and they yeah. can park at any spot so long as they got a handicap placard. Yeah, right. and I did say that. The state doesn't like people to know that. But and they don't have to pay. And they don't have to pay. That's right. Mm -hmm. The well, state does even. not like them parking there. That's why the state has removed all of the handicap parking when they redesigned the state beach. There are very few handicap spaces down there in comparison to what there was. No, but they do meet... Uh, ADA, because I went down there and they do, but they decrease the number of yeah, spaces. I went down and complained, and they showed oh, me yeah. all the. Have you spaces. seen those spaces not being available? Uh, not recently. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Another thing that people have mentioned too, I'll just throw it out as long as we're talking, is that other area that's the town where it's all sand and there's a tree and pe you know a lot of people think that area is underutilized. Seven no. No, that's something we could always think about in the future. In fact, I mentioned to you about whatever happened to that tree. Is that tree that's growing down there? There's one tree there, a big pine tree. Is that the one that we planted on an Arbor Day? I think that was planted, yes. Yeah, wow, it turned into a tree. It was just oh, they, a little... They have a tendency to all of a sudden sprout, tree. yeah. Yeah, I can't believe how big it is. They, they can move quite quickly in an upward direction. Anything else under old business? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the administrative assistant noted that in the uh, minutes of the June 5 meeting, which I don't think were amended tonight, on page 8 of 11, uh, there was a motion by Slackman Bridal to approve the release of the CIP to the CIP committee, seconded by Selectman Barnes, and then there's a note that the vote was 0, zero, zero. I just think that there may not have been a vote okay. actually taken. And so... I, I think just as a, just so we clear that up, yep. if there could be a, mo a, a vote taken on that motion tonight. Okay, so the motion was to accept the CIT, to pass the CIT on? Approve the release of the CIP to the CIP committee. And we had a second? Yes. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. <coughs> You're welcome. New business? Uh, let me, if Oops, I may, just business. one thing under old business. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was uh, in uh, the presence of Mr. Nye and, and Mr. Welsh this week uh, in, in his office and uh, on, on other issues. Mr. Nye uh, represented an interest in rehashing parking, which was formally voted down by this board at the intermodal uh, parkway. Um, up here uh, as you come into town. I forget the vote, but uh, I know that uh, there was uh, rampant uh, community dissatisfaction with that. Uh, he said uh, his inquiry to me was uh, for beach parking. Uh, and and uh, rather than go through the whole hash, I, I think that uh, a parking, we heard of flooding tonight, uh, impervious materials and parking, there's more water that's running off, where does it go? Uh, parking lots today are associated with crime and drugs, prostitution, we talked about uh, increased policing, uh, we talked about the impervious material, the flooding, the degradation of the environment. Uh, we had an incident last week from an out-of-state person from over the border of Massachusetts, which resulted in a standoff for hours and operational cost to our police force. I would uh, request from uh, any of my board members out of uh, um, professional uh, uh, etiquette, and certainly you, Mr. Welch, I spoke with the uh, town planner. Uh, we voted on this issue once. Uh, this this area uh, with uh, diesel fumes and engine fumes uh, has a pollution uh, fan that would encompass our uh, down-to-day day, uh, uh, daycare for children and our children playing on athletic fields with pernicious carcinogens and uh, I uh, am vehemently opposed to it. I think when we take up issues of this magnitude that they're not to be revisited and if uh, the town planner says he's heard some talk about it, I would request uh, from the board members professionally uh, to uh, uh, provide the etiquette to inform me and certainly a formal request to you, Mr. Welch, if you hear through any uh, sister uh, appointed organizations like the Hampton Beach Area Commission or your town planner, uh, I would like to be immediately informed. Thank you, sir. Anything else under old business? New business. Approval of dog, dog warrant. Mr. Chairman, uh, in accordance with RSA 466, Section 14, the dog warrant has been prepared. There are 393 dogs on license in 2017 and 38 dogs from prior years, uh, which we will be queuing the chief of police to take those 38 people to court, uh, that the dog warrant by statute has to be issued. We can't publish it, but we have to issue it to the police department. Motion? I'll make the motion. Second. All in favor? 
Unanimous. Uh, speed limit, 30 miles an hour, Cusack Road. Fred, can I see the dog things? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Anyone in particular? Sure on there. No, we, we've been there. I just want to make sure. Princess isn't on here. Uh, we had a uh, typical with other um, matters of this nature. We had an email request from a, a citizen, Patty Fitzgerald, uh, to place additional signage on Cusack Road. There was one speed limit sign on the road, but um, like too far down. Um, the I had uh, Jim check our ordinance book, and Cusack Road was not listed under either the 30, 35, or any other speed limit sign, uh, speed limit zone. So the request is to designated as a 30 so that I could put up legally speed limit signs in the uh, right. what's occurring is uh, probably heightened by the fact that we paved it uh, it's always been a quick route if you will to the beach uh, I myself as experienced people that see them use it as a speeding zone uh, much to my demise um, and um, there's a number of pedestrians that come from the Sea View uh, neighborhood, that whole area, and walk this corridor to the beach. So uh, it's, I think, incumbent upon us to post it at a 30 mile per hour. I'll make a motion we post it at 30 miles an hour. Second it. All in favor? Thank you. Done. School zone, 20 miles speed limit, high street, both sides, easterly from Mill Road to Hobbs Road. Westerly from Hobbs Road to Mill Road. Uh, B, Mill Road, northbound side from High Street for a distance of 175 feet, southbound side from Emory for a distance of 50 feet. This is just another bookkeeping thing. Uh, so moved. Second. <laughs> is this just during school time? Yes, it's yes. already there, it's just not in the book. Oh. All, right. <laughs> All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Don't you wish everything could go like that? Yes. <laughs> 42 High Street, Beach Walk Condominiums, Construction Cost Estimate Acceptance. 24, on that. $24,637, which has been approved by the Planning Board and approved by Public Works. Agreed. So moved. Second. All in favor? Very good. Do you want to ask us something else? No. I, you know, I'm really good for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it's a issue. I'll give it Robbie. Yeah, Council, you want to? Uh, I would just ask that the board, uh, and upon its uh, conclusion of this meeting, uh, vote to go into a non-public session under RSA 91 hyphen capital A colon three Roman two small e litigation. I'll make so, the. I'll make the motion. Second. Uh, roll call? Yes. Aye. 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 Okay, unanimous. Max, thanks for everything you do. Thanks, Max. Max, will you play next? 